That was an abrupt ending, but welcome everybody to another live stream. We are here with a guest, a special guest we haven't had for a while. So all you QMH users, the man is here to tell us whatever we want to ask about and discuss anything that might be new coming down the pike. We're very happy to have him here. Um, also, this next Saturday is going to be the live stream. Again, I had to move it back one day. We have another birthday to attend. This is my wife's last remaining aunt on her mother's side. She happens to live close to us in Virginia. So we're going to attend uh, her birthday party on Memorial Day. That's this coming Monday. We're going to drive down on Sunday. And so I will not be here to do the live stream. So be aware that we're going to have it again, hopefully for the last time this year on Saturday. So let's say hello. We have 18 people already here with us. Hopefully, we'll have every one of these 18 post on the chat who they are, where they're watching from, what printers they're using or wish to use in the future, what is it that they are interesting, interested in achieving with their printers. Go ahead and share that with us. We love to uh, be able to interact with all of you who are watching. So we'll say hello, first of all, to Harold Goldberg, one of our regulars, always here early. Harold, it is 87 today, nice and sunny here. How are you, my friend? Pro 100 PCSE Inks, QMH Ultimate, Rick Johnson Clean Carts, and Rudy's Holders. That is the top combination for printing, folks. That's it. If you can get all of those products, if you have a Canon printer, you are set. You are set. Gregory, Toronto, Canada, Pro 10 PCSE inks, QMH Ultimate PGI 72 holder. Uh, I've been using mine. Where did I put it? I tell you, I cleaned up a little bit and put everything away. I don't have it here with me, but it's been working really great and it keeps me organized, which is a really good thing if you get what I mean. Jerry Longcall is here from Selkirk, Manitoba, Canada. He's got a Pro 100. And me, I'm here as well. Hello, everybody. Nigel Waters from Carmondenshire, Wales, UK. You got to say the sheer part, not shire, correctly. Kingsbury Crafts says, hello, I think you're new. I don't recall you being with us in the past. Jerry says, question for Mikey Cheney. Will you update the Q Image Ultimate PDF manual? Well, he's here to answer all of those questions exciting existing is almost 11 years old and none of the recent enhancements okay well might as well bring mike right in here and here he is welcome mr cheney hey everybody by the way for those of you who don't know who this dude is he is the creator of QMH ultimate i've been using it since probably the very beginning and uh it used to be a very simple program back then I wanted to create multiple print uh, image layouts and everything else required a lot of work and I discovered QImage. And that's why we are here now in 2022 with the most advanced version of it. So here he is, Mike Cheney. Welcome, my friend. Thanks. Tell us, tell us a little bit about what's been happening. I'm gonna put you here solo. Well, actually the 
the help manual, the new help manual is one of the things I wanted to talk about. So I'll just start with that since we already had a question. Um, if you're not new to QImage and you've um, been downloading updates and stuff like that, you probably noticed that in about the last month, there haven't been quite as many updates. And that's because I'm already working on the, the new help manual. Uh, it's a really long task. And to be honest, I started it once and uh, got a bit of it done and scratched it, started over because I didn't like it. Um, didn't think it read well, but that's currently being worked on. Um, I know I've mentioned this before. There's a lot of those little red V buttons on different dialogues that have videos that show you how to do things because we find a lot of people retain it better and understand it better when they can see it. So you can just click on that and get video help. But um, we still need the written help. So that's currently being worked on. So there's been some of that uh, recently, a lot of work being done on that. Um, as far as news, um, been a, a couple small additions to the software recently. We, we also changed our server for the Ben Artem page for QImage 1 because there were some problems with it. I won't go into details, but it wasn't working very well. We changed companies. We got all that done this week. So now everything's snappy and fast. And if you request a new version through the website, you get it almost instantly and everything works good now. So a lot of the stuff like that going on, maintenance, uh, help files, cleaning things up because the software is working really well and it has pretty much everything you need in it. So we're, uh, we're tidying up. <laughs> so that's now, part I, of what I've we're doing. noticed, you know, I have, a, at least with QMH ultimate side of things, when I see an update available, if I go to the site and people go to the site, don't just go to the software, right? You have a, a tab for instructional videos there that go back yeah. a very long time. You haven't, categorized by level of of simple yeah. medium hard you know or advanced and, and that sort of thing there's a That's learning tab on, there on on the website but right again if i'm being honest i there's so many on there now that i find a hard time i have a hard time finding the mm -hmm. video that i want so i'll just open q image and it like if i want to know something right. about the unclog tool i'll open q image open the file print unclog pattern, and the, I'll click the little red V. So on you have the, a little indicator the, there. Yeah, the little round red V button, I'll click on that. I, yeah, I've it's seen those. faster yeah. than trying to navigate the website because you know, we produce a lot of videos. So, Yeah, but what I was saying is that uh, I don't know what you were referring to the server for. The, it, it was, if you go to benartem.com, yeah. That's Q image one. Right. So say I want to update. Was there a delay in getting Oh yeah, there was delays. Back? People okay. weren't getting their, their emails. Um yeah. we were having to push them through manually. The server was having trouble. Um, so we changed companies. We we tried to get them to fix it. We worked but that's not the one that's not the one you're using. No, DDI software is yeah. Q image ultimate, and okay. that one's okay. yeah, that one's fine. It yeah. was just the Ben Artem server, and now that we got everything switched over, that that website is much smoother now. Yeah, because I've never I've never had a delay. See, a new it's update, a recent I thing. Click it, on it, get the password, blah blah blah. It's and within the past the week. Email. Yeah, and it's only the Ben Artem QImage one side, not the okay. QImage Ultimate side. So, interesting. Wow. Past week we we discovered there was trouble, so the company we were using couldn't handle it. And imagine, <laughs> uh, say, if someone that's doesn't realize how this functions, they might blame you guys. Oh, well, they should. You know, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, really. I mean, we're, well, we're sitting here thinking this is what our customers are, are getting. They, they would exactly. try to download the demo and but they never get yeah, it. It's not necessarily your fault that they're not getting a quick response because that's handled by a third party server. Yeah. If we didn't fix it, Within a few days, exactly. it would have been our fault. Yeah, you would lose we, a lot of we noticed the problem, and people were saying, hey, I, I went and I put in my email to try to get a new version. I never get an email. And we checked, and sure enough, the the server was just not running the way it should. So we called that ISP, tried to get them to fix it, work with them. Uh, we gave it one day. They couldn't fix it, didn't know what they were doing. So we oh, said, wow. we're, okay. we're done. We, we switched sad. companies, completely switched the server and everything. So Okay. Got all that done in a day. 
So for a a user that's using a normal editing software and they're printing through it and they want to test Q image, they can get a 14 day trial on both platforms. Right. And what if they decide to then buy it and they want to use our links that you provided me well, for a discount? How can they do they have to uninstall that one and then use the link no. and don't or what? No, it's the same, it's the same software, and you provide your links in your video descriptions okay. right. for the discount. And I'm sure you'll provide links here today. And that's another thing I wanted to mention. It for anybody here, make sure you order. If you decide to order QImage One or QImage Ultimate, use Jose's link so you can get the discount. Yeah, let me go ahead and acquire those while you're talking. And I will paste them at the bottom here of the chat. So there's one link for the Windows version. And then QImage One comes in two versions, right? Windows and Mac. Yeah, you get both so it's a, that. It's more of a basic, more that's basic. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention. If yeah. there's anybody here who's not familiar with it, QImage Ultimate is the only thing. Look that at was the around. bottom of the chat, folks. I got the links there. Yeah, QImage Ultimate was the only tool that I had. Uh, that was my creation from mm -hmm. long ago, and up until I think January 2018 is when we brought QImage One online. QImage Ultimate was all you could get, but it was Windows only. It didn't support the Mac. So mm -hmm. then. I hooked up with another uh, boy, and were people upset? Person. Yeah, people yeah. were very upset because they really wanted that software, but it wasn't available. It's like you were being uh, prejudiced or something. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, a friend of mine and I created another company, and we needed to do that because now we have uh, two people: one me um, involved with the Windows version and Andrew involved with the Mac version. And and tell folks where that other person lives. Right next door. <laughs> and did you That's have any met. any idea whatsoever that this guy was a a uh, a programmer? No, I mean we moved in and then and was we it, met. isn't he in the Mac developmental group or something like that? The uh, um he's something like he he, he had done some Mac work yeah. before yeah for this which is why i went to him and i said look i need a mac software developer i can't do both so we created a company and we each own half of it and that's been artem mm -hmm. so just to simplify it for people i i've started telling people if you only use windows and you only ever plan to use windows just get qimage ultimate yeah if you have a mac get qimage one and I tell people that because if you don't simplify it like that, then because QImage One comes in Windows and Mac flavors and you can use either one, sometimes people will, they're only using Windows and they'll buy QImage One and then they'll say, well, this doesn't have this other feature that's not related to printing, like raw editing yeah. and photo editing and stuff. Exactly. And I wanted that. And then we got to refund the QImage One so that they can buy QImage Ultimate. Just keep it simple. If you're on Windows, buy QImage Ultimate. It's only ten dollars more. And if you're you on the Mac, ton, a ton more features. Actually. If you're on the Mac, or you yeah. think you might switch to the Mac, or you're in an office or a studio that uses both, buy QImage One. It's mm -hmm. that's the simple way to put it. So I mean, they would have to sort of do. Can they get the the fourteen day trial? Does that come with every feature that QImage Ultimate has, but not necessarily able to do everything? In other words, so they can get an idea, what else do I get besides printing? Yeah, it, with it, QImage Ultimate. Therefore, it comes with I will everything. not buy QImage One for Windows. I will buy QImage Ultimate because I know in the future, as I begin to explore the program, I'm going to be enjoying all these extra features that QImage One, which is more watered down, is basically for printing only, right? It's more of a printing only application. Yeah, it's, I would say it's more of other I would say it's more focused. Focused, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's just the printing stuff. Yeah. Um and QImage Ultimate has evolved over twenty five years now and it mm -hmm. has image databasing and you can search for images. You can convert from one image format to another. 
interpolate and save new copies of images, sharpen them and do levels and curves and editing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's QImage Ultimate. QImage 1, if you take the subset of what QImage Ultimate does that's just printing, that's QImage 1. Mm -hmm. It does one thing well, now, and that's printing stuff. I, I have a bunch of questions that I'm going to ask you in a bit, but let me ask you one I just thought of. All right. When you are working with QImage Ultimate and say you own a DSLR capable of shooting RAW, you're basically working from your RAW images. You're not exporting that RAW image like you have to do in Photoshop, which requires that you open up the RAW image in RAW Converter, do whatever changes you're going to do to it there, and then export it or open it in Photoshop as a PDF, no, as a PSD or a right. TIFF file. In QImage, you're just editing, doing everything, 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 but not really physically affecting your original file, right? And what right. what is that little file that's sex, that is saved next to it? That <laughs> contains everything you did, right? Yeah, it's basically, a lot of people call them sidecar files. You're right. So you still, like, let's say you have a Canon camera, you got a CR2 file. Mm -hmm. That's that's your raw image. QImage will open that, read it. It has a raw refine tool where you can do some raw editing on it, um, like dynamic range adjustments and mm -hmm. highlights, shadows, and things like that. Uh, it's not as comprehensive as Lightroom or Photoshop. Um, because it's not meant to be a full editor. But a lot of times, if you just need to adjust the exposure a little bit mm -hmm. or um, mark off the clouds in the sky and say, I want more detail there, it's a more visual tool. So you mm -hmm. can actually do that. You can mark off the clouds in the sky and a car that might be in the foreground. And you can mm -hmm. say, make more detail in those two areas. And it'll automatically spread out your dynamic range to make those two pop out. So there's things like that that you can do in QImage Ultimate. Because I've known some photographers that are the epitome of being a purist. Uh, I don't know whether they realize that a raw file is never going to look as pop and, and, and snappy as a JPEG that is processed by the camera itself. That is always going to, the raw is going to always look a little bit more drab because it includes so much more. And yeah. Your tool is really not meant to be a full editor, like you said. These right. guys don't want to do much editing, to tell you the truth. They they are very much against editing. I'm, I'm more of a like purist. Yeah. yeah. So you open up that raw and you apply a very minimal adjustment. Like what I do is I click on that little button that says 0.5% shadows. 0.5% highlights immediately brings everything just under white and just above black. I'm done. That's yeah. all I need to do. <laughs> yeah. I don't mind editing when you see your photo and the tree branches might look a little drab or it might yeah. not quite have enough sharpening. But to me, I want it to look like the actual scene. Mm -hmm. I'm not one that wants to topaz the skies and make them look right. purple and the clouds look all Know, contrasting everything. If I want to do that, I'll go into another photo editor to All do right. that. But yeah. QImage gives you the tools to make that image look as realistic as possible mm -hmm. and to develop the raw as accurately as you can. So I have another post. Tony Huerta has been with us for a few a few weeks now, and um, he's in California, and he uses your software, as you can read right there. He uses a 4100, which is a hell of a printer. And if he can get satisfactory results from a 4100 using QMH Ultimate, you know, what else can you say? So yeah. I'm glad that he posted that. I wanted to show it to you. All right. So Koa Tran has a, hello, any update Canon 200? No, I, I, I will probably never own one simply because... It's just extremely difficult to uh, use third-party products on it. And really, the truth is, those OEM inks are superior to anything else, even what precision colors can produce. They cannot even come close to the output quality of a Pro 200. 
Uh, I myself don't have it because I'm into refilling it, so I'm not going to get a printer that I'll, I'll have, you know, go through a lot of hoops trying to refill. You can do it, but there's no way that you have any kind of ink monitoring with it after you disable chips. You're you're running blind at that point. Let me see what else we got here. We got Jerry says Q image help for a Q image help file system. I might suggest an interactive help function built in to the app would be a very welcome addition. I personally find the videos very cumbersome during processing in app. I don't know what that means. Okay. No, I, I understand that. that. If you're if you're trying to get something done and you're you're you want to look up a particular feature, Real you quick. might not want to watch a whole video on it. Yeah, yeah. All right. So that that's the way it will work, by the way. You press the F1 key or something when you're in a particular okay. area yeah. and it will take you straight to that part of the help. That's the way it's set up. So for a basic user that just downloaded the the trial, and you have to admit, Mike, that your user interface it's like no others out there. There's no, you know, Photoshop is different. People may be using or very used to the the workflow of Photoshop or Lightroom or Corel or whatever other software you use. If you want to share your screen now, can you show us just very basic uh, image layout? Say I open up a letter size layout and I want to put down a couple of five by sevens, maybe a five by seven and two, uh, three and a half by uh, two by threes or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Can you, can you, yeah, let me see if I if can, it's not too much trouble. I, I mean, I could do it here. I just don't want to stress my system here because we are both uh, streaming at the same time. Share screen. Once you share your screen, I'll see it and I'll post it up. And I think that's something that people want to see because they, you know, before they go ahead and trial, try the uh, trial, they may be completely, totally confused with the workflow. So we're going to add that. And I think we did successfully. There we go. Yeah. I hope it shows up big enough. I have a wide monitor. So yeah, that's somebody was complaining the other time about that can you maybe move the you know how you can grab like right by the on the left of the layout and have less of the uh previews drag that yeah there you go like that i don't know if you can make it bigger on your end though i cannot i mean that is as see, i mean i just, can see it full screen right now but that's just gonna I don't make know about it people smaller. watching on a tablet or something like that might be a little bit difficult um yeah, I guess we'll. So I, I mean, see what that, you have there now. You have like a. Um, it doesn't help. It's just, you know. Okay. Because we know. can't zoom into it. If you can't zoom in on your side. No, I cannot. Then. Uh, no, I'm locked I'll just to go you with now. That. Yeah, I am locked what, to you. What if you. Can you put our two video feeds underneath the. Um, instead of on the left side? I or, can do this. I can just remove us. Yeah, just just do that. That's about it. That's about all yeah. I can do. I, I I don't pay for StreamYard, so I don't get um, some of the advanced features. Well, this this will work. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, I mean, when you first get um, either QImage One or QImage Ultimate, I would suggest watching the getting started video. Like, see, as soon as you open up QImage, there's a red V button. It says video help is available. So this one on the main screen here, if you click that, it'll take you to the getting started video and it'll tell you now, a lot of this. Stuff hold on one second. So you. you already have some images there. So let's just say nobody edits in Q image. They just got Q image. They have to have already a set of images, say saved after editing. Yeah. Right. Ready to be printed. In other words, but they're just not going to print them in, in Photoshop. And they don't have the they don't have the export plugin or any any of the sort. They just downloaded the the trial. Right? Yeah, yeah. So um, this area right here, and I think this is how this um, video starts out. It's uh, QImage is a tool that just allows you to go straight to where you have your pictures. So we just are going to select from folders here. So this 
bar right here that says folders. Um, when you first get QImage, I think it's open like this, but you can close it so that you can see more thumbnails. If I had hundreds of thumbnails here, I could see more. Mm -hmm. But if you click on this bar here and you can open up the folders, and I think this is similar to Lightroom. You can just um, go to the folders that you work with and um, click on a folder and it will display the images in that folder. Yeah, in Lightroom, you still, you have to, um, first of all, actually physically import them into Lightroom. Yeah, because they, they have like folder. a, yeah. they have like a catalog. We, we have right, albums right, right. here that yeah. uh, do something similar, um, but you don't have to use albums and you're not forced into that. I mean, you shouldn't have to import photos if they're already on your computer. There's Correct. no need to import them into QImage because you can just go to where the images are stored. And I have a whole bunch of uh, photo folders by date and everything like this. I just created this short folder here for the purposes of the demo. Um, so I would have opened this and gone down to the G drive and then located this, clicked on this test folder, and then it builds the thumbnails. And the thumbnails, which are your images stored in that folder, show up right here. And if you look in here, as you use more and more folders, as you uh, click on different folders to do different print jobs, there's a history here that shows you, uh, I think it's 20, 20 of the most recent folders that you visited. So you can go back to them and look at them that way too. Um, so that, that would be step one is to um, just go to a folder where you have some photos and you can start working with them right away. Now, the you mentioned that the QImage interface is a little different, and it's a little different because it's designed for batch printing. So it's not going to have the same mentality as a photo editor. And I, I, I sometimes tell people, just put aside your, your file open mentality that you're using in a photo editor. This is not a program where you're going to open files one at a time. You're not opening anything. You're creating a print job here. So the goal here is to be able to print as quickly as possible and as easily as possible. And the way it's set up is you click on an object and you click on a size. And that's all you have to do. Once you find your photos by traversing the folders here and picking the folder, you've got your images here. And then you just click on an image and you click on a size, like five by seven. And you could click on another photo. And I've already, it remembers that I picked five by seven the last time. So all I have to do is click the plus. And I click another plus. And these are, I have crop turned off. So that's why these are a little different in size um, because I've chosen not to crop any um, of the image off. But if I select this photo right here, it says that this photo is 6.67 by five. And that's because of the aspect ratio of the image. I didn't give QImage permission to crop. Mm -hmm. But if I give it permission to crop, I've selected this print now, and all I gotta do is click on the crop button. Okay, I and have now a it's question. five by seven. I have a question for you. This is very interesting what you just showed me. By not cropping, by having crop auto crop turned off, when people want to print borderless and they have painstakingly shot that photograph so that it, every they want every bit of the detail on that image, not have anything enlarged beyond the edges and cropped off like happens when you print borderless, they can use that method of, of laying it out, say, on a larger sheet of paper, it will print from edge to edge, correct? Every pixel is there, and they can then just, just trim it rather than oh, yeah. try to print it borderless, which is going to lose, you know, 5 6 8% of the image. So when yeah. you, if you can show us that again, but without cropping. Okay, so if, if I turn crop off, which is just yeah. this button right here, and I pick uh, this photo, and I say fit to page. You yeah, see how whole... it, it fit it to the page. This is as big as it can be. Within that 
keeping every pixel in the image and cropping nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll see there's some white space. What is this? About a half an inch on the top mm -hmm. that it could have printed and a half an inch on the bottom. And the reason is because you've not given permission to crop. Now, if I click this and I click crop, it fills the whole printable area of the paper. And if right, this was man. borderless, this is not borderless, which is why you have a gray area here. But if this was borderless, it would fill the entire page. Right. Now, also explain. And I again, I don't understand why this is the case, but always these are the non-printable margins, correct? Right. So you have the leading edge margin is always narrower than the trailing edge margin. Why is that? Imagine if you're printing this in so-called um, oriented in, in landscape, then the image will be kind of offset a little bit, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because of the, the differences in the leading and trailing edge. Yeah, it would have to be because... Margins, the minimum printable margins. Why is it, why is it not the same? The these same are way. hard margins. These are dictated by the printer. So you right, cannot print anything with any software in there. And I've always assumed... I I thought you probably would have a better idea than me, but I've always assumed that on the leading edge of the paper here, you don't need as much of a gap because when you get down to the trailing edge, your rollers may not be able to push that paper yeah. as far as close to the yeah, trailing edge. I've always edge. thought of it as a mechanical reason for this and not necessarily. Yeah, well, I, th yeah. I think it's mechanical. It's I mean, mechanical. Let's, let's go into it's, the transport system properties. requires that. Yeah. And do borderless. Um, what was I on? Oh, plain paper. That's just for demo. Yeah. yeah, we'll do this. Now, see, it's borderless, eight and a half by 11. Mm -hmm. So now if I, with this selected, I go back to the print sizes and do fit to page, your entire page is covered. Mm -hmm. That's a borderless print. But if no, I turn crop it, off. Yeah, on an image such as that, it really doesn't matter that you're cropping off. Yeah, if I turn crop bit. off, then um, the reason that there is a leading and trailing gap here that's not being printed on is because in order to print on that, you have to crop mm -hmm. because of the aspect ratio of the image. Right. So that, that's a choice in QImage. You can just go back and forth. Um, right. And keeping with the mentality that you want it to be as easy as point at something and then say what you want to do. So I can basically point at this print by clicking on it, which I've already done because there's a blue border around it. You can tell it's selected. I can turn crop off, turn crop on. Um, I can change it to a five by seven, a four by six, a two by three. Um, and I think that that makes it a lot easier because QImage um, it basically keeps up with what you want to do. So let's say I want this image and I want a two by three of that. And I want this image and I want a three and a half by five. For this image, I want a four by six. And for this image, I want a five by seven. You just click on the object and then click what you want to do. And it's automatically arranged, placed on the page um, automatically. And, you know, it's showing you the last one that I selected was five by seven. So I can just click on this, or let's say I want more of this one. I just click, 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 and it just keeps creating more pages. Mm -hmm. um, and I have sort turned on here, which is why it kind of looked a little weird. With this sort button on, it sorts the largest prints first to the smallest. Okay. But you can see I clicked a bunch of times on five by seven on that same photo. Mm -hmm. So I've got a bunch of well, two pages of five by sevens, one five by seven on this page. Um, but again, it doesn't matter if you decide you don't want to print this print, select it and then click remove and it's gone. Um, if you want, let's see how many, we got three five by sevens. If you decide you only want one five by seven of this, just you know, you can hold down the control or shift key and select, select multiples and then just remove them. And QImage automatically keeps rearranging them to give you the optimal mm -hmm. uh, space on the page. 
Now you also have um, the ability to select different modes of centering, and I know there's IntelliCenter and yeah. other other types of um, yeah, right there on the bottom area that the. So yeah, let for me... people who just want to print a single image, say with a border, and centered, they will use yeah. IntelliCenter. Yeah. Okay. This is IntelliCenter here. Use. Yeah. Um, IntelliSpace um, okay. starts it in the top left, but leaves a little space between prints. IntelliCut. Uh, let me add a couple more. Let me let's add a couple two by threes in here. Um, now the reason it turned that one is because it knows people like to cut along straight lines, so it tries to be smart about how it's placing these. Um, but this is IntelliCut, and it it's based on cutting. Like, I only want to make a single cut between these, and I only want after I cut those off, I only want to make a single cut here. IntelliSpace just puts some space between the prints, and IntelliCenter will center the prints on the page as best it can. Mm -hmm. And if you just a lot of people only print one print, so let me get these three out of here. Click on this, and I'll do an eight by ten. Now that eight by ten is perfectly centered on that page. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what a lot of people like to do. They just want one print centered, and that's how you do yeah. it. No matter what size you pick, five by seven, that's centered. centered. Four by yeah. six, that's centered. Now any so, off any results that are off center, they're caused by your printer. It's, yeah, it's that's not, a, not the software. That's a whole other uh, yeah, that, that, topic, but yeah, the yeah. printer's inability to to. I always say, you know, when you adjust the guides on a Canon or the newer Epson printers now, is it really dead center? <laughs> yeah, does it really match what your application says center is? Of course not. It doesn't. It's going to be slightly off. Um, unless you're lucky and you get a perfectly calibrated printer, you know, from the factory. Um, so that's, just, you know, that's something to to uh, expect to happen. Uh, but the software will center it perfectly for you. Now, this leads into what you just showed me earlier, where you can just add. And it's actually taking, it's using your existing real estate of paper or acreage. <laughs> Yeah. Um, most effectively, when it comes to roll printing, if I have a roll printer, uh, I know there's a mode that you showed me a long time ago that allows continuous roll printing, and no matter what size prints I send to it, it it makes the best usage of the paper. You know, yeah, you don't uh... waste you don't waste paper. Let's switch to the Pro 2100 here. Yeah. And that's already in roll. There's a lot of people that have a, a higher-end Canon printer or, you know, that sort of thing, and they're printing on roll. That's My P800 is, is strictly a roll printer right now. So this is important to me as well. Yeah. Um, so we've got the Pro 2100 on uh, – I don't care about the paper type because it's we're just demoing here. So it's on roll paper. Um we have this under on the media size here. If you want QMS to control the length of the roll automatically, you can click this button here, auto roll length. And once you click that, um, first of all, in other software, typically you have to set up the length of your page in the exactly. driver. You go into the properties and set the length manually. Well, we don't want to have to worry with that. So in QImage, you can go to auto roll length, now, turn that yeah, on. Let, let me, let me be clear on that. So, if I have a roll printer and I'm using some other software and I, I have to sort of compute, I'm going to print, okay, I'm going to print, you know, 10, 16 by 20s and they're all going to have borders. I have to do math to figure out what the custom size yeah, paper and, I, I need to create. 17 and, by 120 inches. That's yeah. not necessary, right? That's not necessary with the right that, that function you have in other software if i am uh trying to do this i'm, I'm kind of 
you know, holding my head thinking, okay, how many of these am I going to print? How long is that? Which way am I going to turn them? Am I going to be the eight inch side on the length or the 10 inch? And how many rows and columns am I going to have? Well, that might be, that turns out to be 24 inches, but I know there's a gap, there's a margin on the top and bottom. So maybe I'll just make it 25 inches just to be sure. And then you go into the driver and you've got to go into the page setup and, and change the uh, paper length in the in the sizing make it the size that you think you don't have to deal yeah, you with any make that. A custom size yeah you have to make a custom size um and here you can just click on this see this is this the roll here is disabled you just enable it and that's mm -hmm. auto roll length once you've enabled it um you want to be in intellicut mode when you're using this, that's the only proviso that I would add in here um, so that you keep your prints at the top of the page. You don't want to try to center them um, because you're printing top down and you want to adjust the length of the roll. So you want until a cut, which kind of smashes everything together and puts them as far toward the top of the page as you can. That's what you want. Um, and then from there, I can select a print. Let's say I wanted a bunch of copies of this to give people and I want eight by tens. Well, if we look at the page right now, currently the driver is set up for 20 inches by 20 inches. But if I add an eight by 10, now it's 20 by 8.246 inches, which is probably the minimum length for this particular printer. But if I keep adding more of these, let me click the plus button here, add another one, eight by 10, another one. You see how it uh, yeah. automatically extended the roll length there? Add another one, add another one. It's going to keep extending the roll length as you do this, no matter what size you choose. I mean, I could choose um, some four by sixes and and put a bunch of those in there. And it'll just keep on aligning them as best it can. And it'll just keep extending the length of the roll to do that. Now, the good thing about this is I could select, I'm holding the control key, select all these and remove them and, and watch the paper length when I remove these. It goes right back. Mm -hmm. I can take this one and see it's, the roll length has to be this length right now to give you enough space to print. So 24.2 inches right now. If I select this print and delete it, now the roll length is 16.24, yeah. which is what is needed for um, you know, these four eight by tens that are on here. So using that's the way. The, the, yeah, using this layout mode is going to minimize the amount of paper you need for. Say, if you're just printing one size paper prints, everything in there is going to be printed one size. Eight. What is this? Eight by ten. Yeah. Yeah. You're just making eight by tens. They're going to be edge to edge. They're going. They're actually touching. You need a damn good print uh, trimmer to then do the final trimming, but you will end up saving paper because normally wouldn't you end up with a gap in between, right? And that gap can add up if you're printing 100 8 by 10s Yeah, if if you were forced to print multiple pages because you had right. the wrong length, yeah. Yeah. So then you'd be wasting paper. This just it, keeps it, on it, adjusting. It's really uh, just continually adding, 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 and making sure you're not wasting you know, needlessly paper by having yeah. blank areas. Yeah, I, I can tell that there's scaling on in the driver, but we won't worry about if, that. If I do that on my on my PA hundred and I don't use that method, I'll have like a two inch gap between each print. That's yeah. that adds up if I'm printing twenty of those. Right. That's that's twenty times two. That's forty inches of paper wasted. Hmm. Okay, so this is what is this one now? You have a little gap. What did you do, just do? Um, you did I can tell that the, the driver is um, changing this. There's a there's a certain amount of trailing or leading um, gap that's required by the driver, so that mm -hmm. you don't like if you have an automatic cutter or something, you don't want it cutting too close to the print. So there is a small gap um oh wait a minute you're on a 2100 yeah that has a cutter built in right 
I, I don't know. I don't actually have the printer. I just have a bunch oh, okay, of drivers. Okay. I wonder if there's any. I know there's a 4100 Let's user something. here. Would that cutter be able? Okay, that would be a, a really good question. Because normally I would then manually cut this off of the printer, go to my roller trimmer, and visual visually cut my prints down, right yeah, at the yeah. joint, right at the joint where they join. You know. Right. I don't know if this one has a cutter or not, but I don't know if you yeah. just saw what I did. For for some reason, the last time I used the the uh, Pro Twenty One Hundred. I had entered um, page margins in QImage because QImage, you can um, add more margins if you want them. And for some reason, I had um, put additional margins in here to give me a one inch top and a one inch left margin. Mm -hmm. So that's why that was there. I just cleared the margins, the QImage additional margins. And now you can see what the page looks like. It, pushes everything to the top left, okay. everything together. And of course you can, you can change that as well. Uh, if mm -hmm. you want a gap in between the prints, you can. But yeah, this, this shows that indeed you're able to um, just load a roll of paper and you have a huge job to print. You don't have to be constantly creating custom. Yeah. On roll, roll paper, you just don't you have to think print. about the length. Awesome. So that, that's, a, that's a wonderful feature. For those of you who have a roll printer, that's it. Yeah, as All far right. as I know, it's a unique feature. Yeah, very, very good. Um, People go on vacation, Mike, and they want to exercise their printer. And they don't have a neighbor that will come over to, you know, run a test print every single time, uh, every couple of days or whatever. And I've known people literally that ask me, what do I do? I just bought a so-and-so. And I'm, I'm going to be away for a year. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, why did you buy a printer? <laughs> you know, but yeah. regardless, regardless, um, show us a little bit about your unclog tool and how you go. I know there's some advancements to it already uh, that were not there earlier. Um, and how you set up a simple uh, schedule so that when you're away and I, I just I just realized that. When I close Q image and I have that scheduler on, it continues to print, right? Yeah. I used to have to have Q image left open no longer. So there you go, folks. All you got to do is let your let your computer stay on, go on your vacation. Hopefully there won't be, won't be any power outages. And uh, when you come back, uh, you'll be greeted by a bunch of test prints and your printer will be very happy to see you. So give us, give yeah. us a little tour of the unclog tool. And what it can do. All right. Well, the unclog tool is found under the file menu and then print or schedule unclog jobs. So if you click on that, it just brings up this dialogue. And I should have done this earlier because I have a bunch of a bunch of these in here already. Let me um I don't know what this is gonna do, but let me delete every one that I have so that this comes up as it would come up if you're first using it right out of the box. Okay, so here we go. This is what you see the first time you open it. It's telling you click the plus button to create your first un unclogged job. And, and folks, read the instructions right above his cursor. Not yeah, here, this... but on your on your Q image ultimate. That way you can really truly understand what you're doing. Yeah, it gives you some some tips here on on what we're doing. But for the purpose of the video, I'll just keep it pretty simple. Uh, you basically only have to look here where it says click the plus button. You're creating a job. So you click the plus button, and then you click the printer that you want. Let's say I want my um, G620. And I'll go to the properties here. And what we always recommend is to pick a glossy paper um like little paper plus glossy too and the print quality is not really that uh important you can keep it on standard or put it on high or do a custom it doesn't really matter 
the thing here is you want a, a high quality print so that it hits all the nozzles. Um, so you're going to pick a quality paper. And I don't know, we can get into if your printer has photo black versus matte black ink. Um, <clears throat> if your printer has photo and matte black ink, you might have to create two jobs. Because if I create a job here with glossy paper and I say, OK, this looks good, I'm just going to click OK, you don't have to worry about color management or anything. Just the type of paper, click OK. And so I've set up my printer now, and I'll click OK. And it wants you to give the name of the unclogged job. That looks good. It, your printer name is the default. So I'll just click OK. And it says job uh, created. Now, the next thing I need to do is select the colors that I want. Um, so these are the colors of the inks that are used by the printer. The G600 has red, cyan, yellow, magenta, and black and gray. So no matter how many blacks or grays you have, this will cover it. Some people ask, well, this says black and gray, and I have a light gray and a light, light gray. It's fine. They're all covered here. So it's part of gray. Uh, or if you have a light, light magenta or something, it's covered right here. Just go for the check marks that you know and, match. And that printer you have setting, you know, have set up for is dye based, right? So right. you don't have to worry about matte black and photo black. That's for right. pigment printers. I, I just, I don't really want to get into that. Yeah. But yeah. Um, just give us a very basic. If you, sorta. I'll just mention if you're working with a printer that does have matte black ink and you know that matte black won't print if you select glossy photo paper. Correct. All you would do is click this plus and create a second job mm -hmm. and choose matte paper so that that one will use the matte ink. So you basically need right. two jobs. So each job triggers a different black ink. Yeah. Yeah. So now I've created a job and QImage will, as part of the job, it remembers which inks you've selected. Um, and you can go back into properties and change it if you want to. We don't need to do that. We could print it right now, queue it. Um, let's do that. Let's queue it up. So when we queue it up in the live view, this is what it looks like. Um, I, I just wanted to show you it, it prints patterns in various frequencies in order to better exercise the nozzles that's the best way to describe it here's diagonal, mine, folks yeah straight lines diagonal lines different separations and that just pulses the nozzles at different rates i just wanted to show you what it looked like and it's only a half page because let me go back in here i selected half page if i did full page then that would cover the whole page I, I use a half page because I don't really see any need to do more than that. I do too. Now, if we're talking schedule, um, you notice I just opened this and I only have one job that I've saved. If you had more, they would show here, but it remembered everything. And if, even if you go back into the properties for the driver, the paper that I chose is still there. So everything's still good, but now I want to make a schedule because I'm going to be away for a month. So I click on the schedule button first, select the job that you're interested in. Well, I want to exercise my G600 series while I'm away. So you select the job and then you'd say, I'd like a schedule for that printer. And when this comes up, um, there, you're picking the first unclogged cycle that's going to occur. So I could click, uh, this is today, that's what it defaults to. And it, it says here, um, 7 p.m. I, I had that in a in a prior job, but you know you can type in here if you want. And uh, you know, zero 10 p.m. night would be the first job. The next line that, or the next entry that you can make here is how many days do you want between when it prints that? So I could say every three days. How many times do you want to repeat it? I could put it in here three times, and then it would go three cycles. So it would be 
It would print on the third day, the sixth day, the ninth day, and then it would stop. So I put three in here. Minus one is just an indicator to tell it, just do this forever. Print every three days forever. And here um, is just some options. You really don't have to worry about these, but it's just helpful options. Display a pop-up notice 30 seconds before it's going to print one. So if you're doing something else, you get a little pop-up on your computer that says, I'm about to print the unclog schedule in 30 seconds. And then you can say, oh, wait a minute. I better not try to print this document right now. Yeah. Um, Pre-print unclogged jobs as soon as the scheduler is turned on. Um, you really don't have to worry about that because if you click this, all that means is if you check this, as soon as you turn the unclog schedule on, it'll print one right now, regardless of this. So it's going to pre-print one as soon as you click OK. I have that turned off. You can start the scheduler automatically when Windows starts. So those are some of the options. Um, so now that I've got my schedule worked out, I want it to start printing tonight at 10 p.m., print every three days forever. Now it's asking, what unclogged jobs do you want to print? Now you can print more than one. So you could have three or four or five printers in here and keep selecting the new ones and click add and it will add it down here. I could have a Pro 100, select the Pro 100 job from the drop down, click add, and then the second line would say Pro 100 printer. But right now we've only got the one printer scheduled to do an unclog job. So that would that would work if you had a printer with pigment inks and you had two jobs, one for matte and one for glossy black. Right. You, you'd you have a glossy and a job. matte job, yeah. put them both in here. Yeah. And then every time this schedule comes up, think of it as a timer. Mm -hmm. Every time the schedule fires, which is every three days at 10 p.m., it will print all of these unclogged jobs. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. And then this is, you know, advanced down here, per cycle job tuning, um, uh, per job cycle tuning, I should say. Um, this just allows you to, if you have five different printers and you don't want them all printing on the same day, you could select this printer and say, print on the first cycle and then every three days. Then I could select my Pro 100. If I had a second line here, I could say print on the second cycle and then every six days, you know, skip different ones. So mm -hmm. again, it's just kind of an advanced feature. But when you click OK here, it would uh, ask you, would you like to visually verify one unclogged job? No, I know what it looks like because we just did the queue, you know, put it in the queue and looked at it. I'll say no. Um, and this gives you a little... It's not really a warning. It's just a confirmation. You're about to set this thing up so that it's going to print while you're away. You better make sure you've got paper in there. Uh, if there's a jam or something, you know, you can't control it. That's kind of what this is telling you. And it just confirms, do you want to start, start the scheduler now? And I click yes. And it says first unclog job will print at 10 p.m. today. So now I can close this dialog. And you'll notice this little clock up here, this blue clock. If you hold your cursor over that, it will tell you the next unclog cycle is today at 10 p.m. Uh, you can right click here to edit the schedule or just if you decide, OK, I just wanted to set it up. But now I've got it set up. I don't really want it to print now. Just click there and turn it off. And the next time you want it to run again, just click back on the clock here and it's going to tell you when it's going to start. Click yes. And it's back on now. So. That's the basics of how that works. And again, if you if you want to see the dedicated video that shows you how to do this, if you have some questions, uh, get a little more detail than we covered today, maybe there's this V button here. You just click that and it'll show you the video. So if you need a reminder of how to do some of this stuff. Now this this function is not to be confused with a real nozzle check. Right. Okay. This is just to exercise. This is what people would say. Well, can I just print a print, an image, just to exercise my printer? Well, this image that this creates for you is probably the most effective image that you can run through to what to exercise 
your printer because it's designed to do that. It's not an image yeah. of your dog. It's not an image of your right. Let's see. In the background. If if somebody chose to print this image, and they say they're exercising their printer, well, yeah, that'll exercise cyan and a tiny bit of yellow, yellow in the beak. And, yeah, and uh, you know, not magenta much. Yeah, not or not red. much magenta. In, in your not case, a whole lot of red black. Ink. Yeah, but what that unclog pattern is uh, balanced. It yeah. it it exercises every color the same amount. Yeah, well, so that's why it's more you like a that. custom. It's customized because you're picking the actual colors in your ink palette of your printer. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that covers it. That was that's awesome. Great. Yeah. So that's that's how you do that. Actually, if anyone, you know, everybody travels, everybody goes on vacation every once in a while, that feature alone, I I you know, I would buy it. Period. Not that I'm trying to sell it, but yeah, that would be one feature that I would, um, you know, would sell it for me. Okay. A while ago, not recently, but quite a while ago, you introduced deep focus sharpening. And I yeah. keep telling, uh, people keep asking me, well, but can you really see the difference between, you know, printing with this application and printing with QImage? And I say, yeah, you can. It's hard to me for me to explain physically what it is that i am experiencing with my eyeballs but it just looks cleaner i don't see little halos around little areas that are sharpened like you would with uh, your standard sharpening tools in photoshop and other applications can you walk yeah. us through what the heck is deep focus sharpening i know you have some yeah. uh, very good videos on that as well but i have you here so i might as well yeah, let me Thank see you if you can. That. Let me see if I can drag drag this tab from Chrome over here. Uh, this is a Q Image website, and if we go to technology, and then click on deep focus sharpening, you'll you'll get this example here. Now, this example is an extreme example to show. Um, the difference between unsharp mask and deep focus sharpening. And <clears throat> I think it says, let's see here, radius 10, strength 100. Well, you would never use a radius 10 sharpening on this image, but we used it here to bring out what we're talking about with deep focus sharpening. If you've ever sharpened with unsharp mask and you need to sharpen at like a three or four radius because you really want that high contrast. I know everybody has seen halos around edges like this. Now, again, they're exaggerated here because we went for a radius 10, but uh, typical sharpening in other tools will use unsharp mask. And even if you use, um, you know, different forms of unsharp mask, they're all based on unsharp mask. And what happens is Around dark detail here, you'll get a brighter halo outside of that, like these branches. And around bright sections, we don't really have that too much here, but around bright sections, you get dark halos. And that's just the way Unsharp Mask works. So the pretty ridiculous uh, strength of 10 and 100 is used here to show exactly what's happening with deep focus sharpening, you can use a radius of 10 and strength 100 with deep focus sharpening because it just doesn't have halos. It has all of the good effects. You see how, look at the original here. You see how hazy this looks? And this was a corner of an image, which is why I picked this. You wanted the pine needles to be a little sharper and the branches to have more contrast. And that's what you get with sharpening at a higher radius. You can do it with deep focus sharpening. Look at the edge of the shingles here. This is what Unsharp Mask does. It'll take a dark edge here, and instead of just quickly going into blue sky like it should, you'll get a, a brightened halo around that. It's an artifact of Unsharp Mask. And as you can see over here, this is the same amount of sharpening, radius 10, strength 100. 
but DFS, deep focus sharpening, can even handle that level of sharpening. There's no halo around the branches. There's no white halo against the dark roof tiles here. You just get a really sharp contrasty uh, sharpening. And it's basically what I did with this was um, I noticed that you, could, you can see these artifacts, just not as much, but they show up in grass and leaf petals and uh, like sharp, sparkly objects that you may take a photo of, a necklace on somebody's neck, uh, tree branches against the sky, pine needles against the sky. Even at radius of two or three, they show up. It's just not... Right. You know, this is for demonstration. Yeah, purposes. edges that are differing, uh, different densities, will have that that artifact show up. Right, and, and so what I did was I looked at Unsharp Mask, and I went into the algorithm that Unsharp Mask uses, and I said, okay, what creates these artifacts? Let's get rid of them, and that's what deep focus sharpening does. That's, you know, put it putting it in layman's terms. Um, we take an unsharp mask and just remove the artifacts from it. And that's what you get with deep focus sharpening. Deep focus sharpening or DFS as we call it is the default sharpening method used by QImage when you print photos. We all know that um, in QImage, um, we can choose when we're printing, we can choose sharpening. Other tools offer that too. You can choose a level of sharpening when you print um, and instead of using the old clunky unsharp mask that all the other tools use that make halos, we use deep focus sharpening so that you get really sharp results without the artifacts. Mm -hmm. So that's best explanation. I, can I, I think that's about what makes the difference and whether you realize it or not, I, I do see it in prints. I could do, you know, out of Photoshop or, and then export from Photoshop to QImage and then print it. That's really my workflow. I edit and if I got to do something that requires layering, I will use Photoshop. If I just need to do single layer editing, I use Lightroom, but I always export to QImage. And simply once I'm there, I just hit, I just create my layout and print. Yeah, and it, it, that, it's hard to, to do. It's hard to characterize visually what that does with your prints. They yeah. just look cleaner because you're not going to see, um, like I said, this this is a bit ridiculous to try to sharpen this much, at least with unsharp mask. But right. you would still have a, a tiny little white line next to these tree branches that would show. And it just makes the uh, prints look like they have a little bit of frost on them or something sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's just... Um, cleaner coming out of Q image because of the deep focus sharp. And how would that affect, let's just say for instance, because your up resting algorithm that you use is also different yeah. from those used by other applications. An explanation of that would be, uh, say you have an image that is not super high megapixel image, say a 2000 by 3000 pixel image but you want to make a 13 by 19 and keep it at the native resolution of a Canon printer, 300 PPI or 360 for an Epson. You don't have right. enough pixels, so you have to up -res. How does deep focus sharpening work when you're up so greatly? I mean, from at, three, at 2,000 yeah, by 3,000 should not be more than, what, 6 by 10. And you're trying to make a 13 by by 19. Right. Yeah. So you're you're well, that that's a, a good question. And that that that's where Q image brings everything together. Yeah. Um if you have a low resolution photo and you're printing it far beyond what you think you should be able Which to. Which I have done and I am shocked at the results yeah. I'm getting. As what as what I'm happens saying. is you can take a low resolution photo and print it at 13 by 19, but with a typical tool, um You'll, you'll find that the output looks really soft. Like you could do it in Photoshop and maybe choose bicubic smoother, bicubic sharper, yeah. try to interpolate it. But the problem is there's a correlation between how far you stretch pixels 
and how soft they're going to look. Because mm -hmm. if you take something and you just, you know, quadruple the size, only a quarter of your pixels are real. Three quarters of exactly. them are interpolated. Yeah, so, manufactured. <laughs> right, manufactured. So it, your image is going to be sharper because it doesn't have enough detail. So what happens is the lower the resolution your photo and the bigger you print it, the softer it gets. And you're going to have to add quite a bit of sharpening back to get it to look realistic. And you just can't do it with unsharp mask or typical forms of sharpening. But deep focus sharpening is so good that you can bring back the sharpness. It's still not going to have all the detail. I mean, you, you can't do it. You can't manufacture exactly. reality. Yeah. But it will still make it look like a realistic, <clears throat> sharp photo. It won't look soft anymore. And the main thing that QImage is designed to do is be able to look at how many pixels are in my original photo, how big am I printing it, how far do I have to interpolate it, and once I've interpolated it, how much do I have to sharpen it in order to get it to look good and the same quality at any size you print, regardless of the resolution of your original image. And that's all the calculations that QImage is doing in the background to get you there. I, I forget what the actual reason for this video you did once. You were demonstrating some sort of artificial intelligence. Um, oh, yeah, that was the AI what, gigapixel thing, yeah, I think. Yeah, what was that for enlarging images? That's, being that was for super well, extreme enlargements. Right, where, where, where it recognizes an eyeball yeah and, and and it knows yeah you know what is that's a that's Topaz because like Labs. you said you know you cannot nothing can guess what would live between two pixels when you're trying to increase it to 20 pixels you yeah see what i mean so you know you have to have but some kind of that's why they call it intelligence yeah that's why they call it ai and it's i yeah. think it's topaz labs that does topaz it it's Lab. really it's really yeah. good it, i mean yeah. it works i mean some of the um examples are you know, almost unbelievable like you mm -hmm. can get that from this and they're kind of using ai well an eye should go there mm -hmm. and of course it's not perfect they may put the wrong shape eye in there and you might look at that person and say it doesn't that's look right sister. yeah that's <laughs> yeah <my sister. laughs> yeah but it, it does it does a really good job but that's really for when you start getting up into you want to take a you know, I used to be able to say cell phone photos, but cell phones are almost no, as good as DSLRs good these yeah, days. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, take an old flip phone shot and print it at 30 by 20 inches or something. Mm -hmm. Then that product starts to stand out, the AI. But for regular interpolation of photos that you and I deal with, um, this forage interpolation here, we have so many different ones that were invented over the years by me this latest one is the best so currently um it, it does a better job than bicubic or you know the typical ones mm. and you really don't need anything more powerful than that for the interpolation it's the sharpening part that's the trick that is difficult to do and that's where that deep focus sharpening comes in all right now the most difficult thing for a beginner getting into photo printing is mastering or understanding ICC profile use or printing with the driver alone. And there are ways to print with the driver that allow you to still use a profile made for that paper. You can print on a Canon printer. You can print on an Epson printer with Canon paper that is listed in that menu or an Epson printer, vice versa. And then you choose color mode ICM, and that links it to that profile that lives in your hard drive. Now, right. you have to have your application that you are printing from to not control color by allowing the printer to manage color or the driver to manage color. But that brings this, you know, oh, wait a minute. Did I turn that on or off? So tell us what you did in QImage. Give us a little demo. You have enough printers to do that. You can yeah. I've even tried to fool the system and I cannot get yeah. it full. I cannot fool it. It always catches me. I on yeah, purpose can't. I on purpose try to screw up and it always corrects me. 
You can't so, double profile in QImage or set the color management wrong. Um, the way because that, that I that's, mean that's gonna that's gonna relieve a lot of headaches. That yeah, double profiling. Oh, that's the that's the worst one. People yeah. are double profiling. They're getting this muddy looking magenta ish looking prints, and they don't know why. So go ahead. Yeah, well. I'll just start with the Pro 100 here. I, I have a profile selected. So if I go into the driver and I check um, on the main tab here, color intensity, and I go to the matching tab, it's set to none, which it should be because QImage um, is using the profile. It's controlling so QImage color. QImage is controlling color. Therefore, the driver is not. Right. You don't. So, you don't you don't have two orchestra directors trying to compete with each other. Right. Now, in, or, in yeah. other software, um, you could go into the driver. See, I have my printer profile is selected. This is a custom profile that I made. Right. Um, so QImage is controlling color by this printer profile. So I know I want color management off in the driver. But if I go in here and go here, and if I select ICM or driver matching, either one, in some other software, and I click OK, now I'm double profiling. Mm -hmm. But now I've changed it to ICM, so I'm, I'm double profiling, right? So let's save that. Save that. It won't let you do it. It says printer driver color matching settings have been auto-applied. Now, if I go back in here and open this again, it set it back to none. Right. And it won't let you screw it up. Now, there, that is an option. If you want to screw it up, if you really want to do it, you can. No, I don't want to do that. <clears throat> I don't want that option available. But the other thing that it does, it goes the other way. Let's say, yeah, I don't want to use this profile. Now I'm using it. I want to just let the printer manage color. So I can drop down printer profile and set, let printer driver manage color. Now you get, I get the message again. Printer driver color matching settings have been auto applied. So if I go back into the driver, we see that QImage has automatically set this to ICM. It came off gonna, of the it's none. It's actually choosing the profile for the paper that you have chosen. Yeah. You better be using that paper. Right. Right? Yeah. So let's try to screw it up again. So I've said let the driver manage color. Now let's turn it off in the driver. Oh, wow. It okay. fixes it. It yeah. fixes it automatically. It's matching settings have been auto applied. So if I go back in here, even though I selected none, it put it back on ICM because it knew you did something wrong. So it will not yeah. let you double profile or mess up your, your prints. Same thing. Go no. back to the profile. I go back to the profile. It was, we just saw that it was set to ICM. I go back and I browse and I select a new profile or I just, this is the last one. It remembers the last one. So let me just select that and auto applied, go back in the driver and you'll see that it set it back to none in here automatically. Now, so since you are there right now, why don't you demonstrate um, like me, I'm sure you have several hundred profiles installed. So yeah. go ahead and choose a common Canon paper and then show us the easy way to find manually to find the matching profile. Yeah, well, when you, when have you, the when you first, this is the default. So when you first use QImage, it's going to have this in here because it doesn't know what profiles you want to use. So <clears throat> you've selected uh, a Canon Pro 100 photo paper plus glossy two, and you're going to select a profile here, printer profile. You want to know which one to select. So just drop this down and do suggest printer profiles. When you do that, um, look which ones are at the top. Canon Pro 100 photo paper plus semi gloss. They mm -hmm. don't have a, they don't have a semi gloss uh, or, or a uh, glossy two. That's why right, right, it yeah. gives you the closest one that it can find. Let me select. Um, yeah, let's see. Select, select another odd paper. That's... Paper. 
Oh, matte photo paper N. I don't know. There you go. There you go. Um, so now I go for the printer, just drop down printer profile and do, I want a suggested profile. What should I pick with this? And look what comes up, matte photo paper N for the Pro 100. And these are sorted in order of relevance. So, I mean, you can see how many I have. I'll go page down, one page at a time. That's the next page, 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 page. I've got all of these. And if it sorted them by printer name or something, you'd never find it. Right. So it'll put all the Pro 100 stock profiles. That's how it finds it. If you have ones that are, see, these these are all of the Canon profiles. Because keep on scrolling down here. I'll find ones that I created. Here's some custom ones uh, that I created. But they're still Pro 100 because Pro 100 is going to be at the top. Once you get past all the Pro 100s, look, the Pro 1000 starts coming in and the Pro 200, 300, so 2100. The, the relevance keeps dropping. The relevance keeps down. dropping off and then you yeah, get stuff that doesn't down. make sense. But the first one or the second one is usually the one no you one. want. Select, uh, it doesn't matter what even printer we're on. Let's say, select the... Uh, Where am I Epson? Oh, here we go. Uh, Epson. I thought I had the P800 here. I don't know. Do we have any for the 3880? There's luster paper. I mean, uh, 3800 luster paper suggest a profile. There it is, 3800. Uh, you see the second one here, premium luster. The yeah. 9800. I must not have any profiles for the 3800 so, except a test one. What suggestions do you have for people who may basically not want to use OEM but want to create nothing but custom paper profiles? What is the naming convention they should use to allow this pretty much suggested or automatic search mode to place their custom profiles? near the top don't they have to all right yeah, here's, that's a specific way <clears throat> that's a good question i've switched to the pro 1000 here platinum paper suggest profile there it is pro 1000 pro platinum all the way at the top now so if i was let's making say if you created a a custom profile for platinum paper or you have another you have red river platinum paper or something mm -hmm. you created a custom profile you for your custom profile, you still want to select the same media type because that's right, the kind right, of paper right. you're using. So you would still select Photo Paper Pro Platinum. To get your custom profile to show near the top, what you want to do is name it in the same convention as Canon exactly. uses. So I would suggest yep. Canon Pro-1000-500 space Photo Paper Pro Platinum and then space, Red River. space Red River or something yeah. else. That way it will... Well, it's it's detecting the relevance by this printer name, this media type, and that's how it found this. So you kind of have to go by the you're logically naming the paper so that this yeah it's like you can find it. It's like you're just doing a search online and, and results come up. If by I name relevance. it uh, Joe's Red River Custom Profile, it's never going to show up on the top. It has to be named a specific way. Right, or a, even if you name it Canon Pro Space One Thousand. It's going to show up differently. It'll, yeah. it'll probably still be. It's pretty smart. It'll probably still come up near, very near the top, mm -hmm. as long as you have Pro in it, Canon in it, Pro in it, 1000 in it, Platinum in the media type. It'll probably be close to the top. But try to keep the Canon standard, and then just add on to it. For the right, name. and the same thing applies to Epson. Whatever naming convention they use, yeah, just use something yeah. similar to name them. And of course, uh, put, when you put, put underscores wherever they exist in the actual um, real OEM name, and that way this search system will work for you. Right. And um, of course, when you get all of this stuff the way you want it, the convenient thing about QImage is you can save just about anything. So mm -hmm. I've gone into properties. I've set up the, the paper type, the quality, and everything that I want. So now you just click on this Save Current Printer Settings. And you can see how many I have in here. There's a yeah. look, there's a one, one, one. I'll just double click that and overwrite it. You sure you want to overwrite this? Yes. Now that setup is saved. 
the next time, let me change this to, I don't know, an Epson. Now the next time I want, uh, I'm thinking I want that Pro 100 with that uh, paper that I was using the other day. Just click here and choose that 111 that we just saved, open it, and everything's back the way you had it. Yeah. The profile, the printer driver settings, paper type, media size, media type, everything. And that would be very handy for multiple printer owners. Maybe, I don't know, if you just have a single printer and you only print on one type of paper, maybe not so, you know, but for guys like me and you and Mike, uh, who has, Mike has, he's up to 20 something printers now, so. That would be uh, yeah. You can help. save setups yeah. from from yeah. all that, and and one step further. Let's say I didn't even show you this. Uh, okay. Let me. Uh, I've got a, a setup here, and <clears throat> of course, you're not limited to just what Q Image gives you. I can take this and move it up here. Mm -hmm. Take this one, move it down here, get a you know a little bit different look to it that I want. Something like that just because I want to, or I can, you know, drag this. If I don't care about specific size, I can take it and drag it a little bit bigger. Even uh, let's overlap say I want to overlap, it. overlap yeah. them a little bit. Yeah. Or I say, Nat, I like this one on top. Bring that one to the top. Now this one's on top and that one's on the bottom. So you're, you're basically layering. You're using layers. Yeah. These are layers. Yeah. Yeah. And not only that, I mean, I could take this one. Let's, do something. It's not going to work too great with bird images, but uh, let's take this one and make it really small and put it inside that one. Now it's on the bottom, so no problem. Bring it to the top. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want it there. I want it like right there. So that's what I've got now. It's uh, it auto groups too, and think of it like a placemat. You mm -hmm. drag a placemat on your table with. Uh, a plate and fork, knife, and spoon on it. If you take the placemat and drag it, everything that's on top of it moves with it. Mm -hmm. So this little print that I stuffed on top of this one here, I can select it again and move it somewhere else within that. But if I move the big one, the low one goes with it. Right, that's your placemat. There's, there's a whole lot of things that you can do with it. Yeah. But now let's say I like that. I'm going to save it for, I might want to reprint this again. You might have a, you know, a, a school picture of a, a classroom of students and then, a plaque down here or something, you know, make it more realistic. Obviously, two birds on in, in this format is not very uh, useful, but let's say we've done something like that and we want to save it. I showed you how to save printer settings, but go one step further, you can save a job. So let's click the big save up here and you can tell I like ones. Just so, so you know, that's a perfect segue to the next question that I had. Continue. I'm, oh, not all right. even, I'm not even uh, going to tell you. All right. Um, that, that is exactly what the next question was. How to I, save I name jobs. A, I name a lot of stuff ones and twos so they show at the top for demos. Right. But I, I don't know what this is. I don't care what it is. I'll save it. Um, save the job. Now, I can get rid of these. And let's say I come in a different day. I've got a different printer. Let me choose this Epson different paper size. Yeah, he can close Q image and come back next week or next year. I can year. close it and come back. It doesn't next matter. Yeah. And I think, ah, I want that job with that. There's two birds. So I just click on the recall button, um, click on the job. And when you do that, it shows you the pictures, you know, in succession yeah, here that are in that job. And then I just open the job, say, I want the whole job, not just the settings. I want the job as it was. And that's exactly what I had created. Mm -hmm. So really a good thing for uh, event photographers. Um, you're covering a bunch of uh, little league games and you have taken portraits of all the little kids and created pic picture packages, right? You didn't earlier, you showed us how to do multiple images in one sheet. Yeah. Um, save it. And then six months from now, somebody wants a set of prints. Recall job yeah and and it saves let me let me interrupt you because i i love this this is one of the main reasons i want q image it saves all the settings you use to initially print it printer 
uh, layout, uh, paper choice, profile, settings, you name it. All of that is saved, right? Yeah, and I just – I showed you how to save it manually. You can give right. it any name you want. You could give it a useful name like so you can recall it later. But every time you print, QImage automatically saves the job yeah. so you can anyway, bring back yeah. that job. So yeah. if you click on this button right here, it says open the automated job log. So that shows me every time I printed – I don't have to save anything. I didn't save anything. All I did was print here. And it shows me every job that I've printed over time uh, all the way back. I think it goes, how far down does this go? Back to 2015? It just doesn't have <laughs> so, a specific name. I mean, you know. Yeah, it's got it's named by, you can name them different right. ways. There's yeah, options. Sure. But yeah. if I wanted to go back to last week, if I know that I printed something on uh, May 3rd, I can go back here and find the job and reprint it. And it will bring it up. The same way, like if I click on it, it would bring it up the same way as it brought up this job that we saved manually. Mm -hmm. And it would show you exactly what you printed that time. And you can reprint it and it will look exactly the mm -hmm. same. And it's not you know, tearing up your disk space either because it's just a job that loads back the images as you had them, all the settings, all the print driver settings, everything. It's not saving like a five gigabyte print spool file. It's right. saving this as a job so that it's just bringing back what you created and reprinting it. When you reprint it, it reprocesses it, but it ends up reprocessing it exactly the same way as it was the prior time you printed it. Okay. And if you're like me, that doesn't remember what he did yesterday. That's a very, <laughs> very, very uh, important uh, feature to have available. Yeah. Uh, let me let me go back to your to your um, automatic color management. Um, I should have asked you this. When when someone does not own one of these or, you know, a spectrophotometer and cannot create their own custom profiles, they would have to come to me or you or whomever is offering that, that, that um, you right. know, service and download the TIFF files. In other words, the charts that you need to print correctly. Can you walk us through how to properly print a profile chart because a lot of people don't know how to do that correctly. And when they get their profile back, it doesn't produce the results that they were expecting to have because they may not have been printed correctly using zero color management on either the printing application right. or the printer itself. So I know that QImage has a functionality for that, for that specific type of job built in. Right. Well, the main thing you want to do is when you're printing a profile target, obviously you want to select the printer and the media type that you're using, but you want to go into the driver and <clears throat> make sure that the quality is the quality that you intend to print with. Um, the size of the paper is right, but you don't have to worry about color management. You can forget about that. You just want the paper type, the quality that you're using, and the media size. So let's say that I've set that up. Um, what I would do, the, the main thing that you want to do is come to printer profile here and select off because that's going to print it raw. That's not going to apply any color adjustments or anything else. And when you select off, it tells you. Uh, Raw data is going to be sent to the printer. This normal option is normally used when printing color test targets. So it's just warning you, are you printing a test target? You say yes. And that's basically all you need to do. That's it. Now, in, in QImage, let me select this profile again. Let me, let me quickly show people what I'm talking about here. It's one of these. So this is what you have to – this image will be sent to you by the profile maker – that you have contracted to make a profile for you, you have to then take this image and print it on the paper you want the profile for. Paper, the printer, and the inks that you're using will all be sort of hand-in-hand -hand creating a custom profile that will then produce accurate output on that combination that you are um, insisting on printing with, in other words. And so in order to do that, you have to have this chart printed correctly. That's yeah, what and I, it just comes in. I don't have one of those 
available, but let's say I did. Let's say that this bird picture right here looks like that chart you just held up. Mm -hmm. So let's pretend this looks like a chart. What I would do is click here, and then in the print sizes, I would choose original size, and that should give you the size that it wants. If right. that's too big, let's say – uh, you get a poster. No, those, or it those tells chart, you. Uh, um, those charts are usually standardized to fit in a letter size paper, eight and a half by right. eleven. So it should work. You have to, yeah, original size will fit it perfectly. So you, you it would has choose. To, it has to fit on your scanner device. Otherwise, right. if it's too big or too small, it's not going to be able to be scanned correctly. Right. So you would choose original size, and then you would get, you know. Um, let me rotate this. So you would get your your uh, chart looking like this with mm -hmm. the patches on it, ready to print. And then um, you can also, if you don't want to go through all these steps, like technically it's good to turn sharpening off because you don't want to sharpen a target. And the, the fastest inter interpolation, you can choose vector here. You don't have to do any of that. But if you go here to the... Um, save jobs and you scroll let's see is it at the bottom um here we go here you guys won't have this many extraneous jobs in here i have thousands because of what i do but there's a job if you go to this recall button there's a job called printer target setup with this little q in brackets if you open that job, it'll automatically set all this for you. It'll set printer profile to off. It'll use vector interpolation, which is faster printing and, and smoother. It doesn't try to sharpen edges like some of the other interpolation methods. Turn sharpening off. So you can also do it that way. I don't typically do that because what happens, if you understand how interpolation and sharpening work, what happens when you print that target that you held up is – that these two things are only going to affect the ed, the very edges of each of those squares. Mm -hmm. The inside is solid, so it's not going to make any difference. So you don't really have to do this, but it's another way you can do it if you just want to click that one thing. Um, I would I would just do it like like we showed, which is I think I would turn agree. No, I think I would agree to have those settings turned off because. As you're sliding your 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 sensor, your light, your your sensor across each one of those squares, it's pulsing at 200 pulses per second. So depending on the 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 speed that you move that scanner across, if you hit an edge that's slightly different, that's being recorded, and it's going to be included in the final guess. Yeah, I would the, think they'd the, have some slack so, in there or yeah, order, but I, I don't know. I. I'm I mean, technically, it's good to do. So you yeah. can always select that printer target test job, and it'll yeah. do all this I would for want you. it as smooth as possible. See, when you're doing um, test charts on something like a rough canvas paper or even real canvas, you run into problems where your the light from the sensor can actually create little shadows <laughs> in all of those irregularities of the paper. And it, it gives you some problems sometimes reading. You want a very smooth color uh, patch to read, and if you go slow, yeah. you can take probably fifty pulses per per patch, depending how fast you go across. And the more pulses you can read, the more accurate then when they are combined to make a, a, a guess of how far off your printer's reproduction of that value was compared to what you know it should have been originally. And yeah. that's how it figures out the plus or minus error rate. Here's here's one thing that people forget, though, uh, when they're printing these targets. They'll print the target and they'll think they're done. L let's say I had it in here and I click print. I And I think, okay, it's printed. I'm done. You're not done yet. What you should do is click this save button right here mm -hmm. and save this printer setup and name it what you're going to use for when future. you have the profile after you've created the profile so uh -huh. I'm, let, let, let's say uh my no, let's say abc brand paper whatever let's just call it that and save it now you know you have that saved 
because what I run into sometimes is people will print this and then the next time they won't have saved a setup. So when they're ready to use their profile, after they've used their tool to scan everything, they have a profile now, they'll come back in here and they'll select the wrong paper type. Right. They'll select a different quality. Instead of custom, That's they'll it. have it on standard or something like that. The key to getting a profile to work properly is that your profile needs to be applied to the exact same settings as were used when you printed the right. test target. Paper, so quality. The way we do that is even though this is off, that's fine. It's off. Still save it. Save the setup because that means that, okay, now I've created my profile with my scanning tool and I'm ready to use it. I come back in here and I open this. Um, here's my ABC. ABC brand paper. Open that. Now I know I've got my settings the way that I printed the target. Now all I have to do is go here, browse printer profiles, select, uh, let's just pick one at random, but this is the new one I created, let's say. I open that profile. Now I can add the profile that I created, save it again, and overwrite that ABC brand mm -hmm. paper. Now I have the setup, everything exactly the way I need it for that new profile that I created. Yeah. So now the next time I open it, it'll bring in the profile. So the only thing that you're changing is changing this from off to the new profile that you yeah. created. But it, it, if you save when you print your target, that ensures that you're not going to make mistakes when you actually use the profile because mm -hmm. you can recall that printer setup. There you go. And that's one of the uh, many, many little things that you have to remember for consistent results, because what I get pretty much regularly is that yesterday I printed with this paper printer combination and today I'm getting a slightly different result. Well, something changed. Uh, Mike, have you known printers to do things on their own? Just, uh, just to mess with you tomorrow? No, Windows they, can. They, 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 they don't. They, they, <laughs> but no. If you don't use them for a month, yeah, they may have clogs and whatever. The worst but I've really, seen is some it, of the Windows it, updates will uninstall a printer driver window, sometimes. Yeah, uh, that <laughs> happened. So far, I've been lucky. Um, it only happened with my Pro 1000. All of a sudden, I was printing, and it would print about a third of the way. It would stop spit the paper out and just sit there and go click 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 yeah and i went through all kinds of hoops to try to fix it ultimately what i needed to do was throw away the uh installation and reinstall the printer yeah. and it was fine and to this right. day i haven't figured out whether it was it was a large update that took place the night before yeah. and um so far, every other printer has not suffered any kind of a negative effects from updates. So yeah, those, you know, knock, those, knock on wood. Those so big far, updates. Would, yeah. That's that's when you know Bill Gates is going through your garbage cans out by the street. There you go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> He'll find something in there. When we were chatting earlier before the broadcast went live, we were talking about soft proofing and also gamut warning. And let's also touch on your i know you incorporated this a while back but it had to do with rendering intents and how you have been able to incorporate sort of guessing what rendering intent you should be using uh depending on the colors of your image whether they are I all know. in gamut or some of them are out of gamut and it might choose to suggest to you to use say uh, perceptual rather than the other one Right. So if you want to go ahead and touch on that. So we're going to talk soft yeah. proofing primarily and gamut warning. I know you can do that in QImage now. Yeah. Um, well, maybe if you have an image with some really crazy colors, maybe yeah, that that's parrot, I, the parrot. Yeah. I actually have one here that I was dealing with something I wanted to show you. Um, so let's put a five by seven 
on the page here. And let's go back here. I'll remind myself. Yeah, I'm using the – that's the wrong profile because we had selected one randomly. Um, well, let me just pick up, suggest profile, pick up uh, the uh, one for semi-gloss, and I'll actually change to – semi-gloss. The reason I'm doing that is because soft proof, oh, this is my custom profile. It remembered that. So that's good. Um, the printer profile and your monitor profile come into play when you soft proof. So when you're soft proofing, you're soft proofing what a simulation of what the print would look like on your monitor. Hold on. You said monitor profile. I have people who have come to me and said, my prints are horrible, and this is what I'm doing. And they actually showed me a screen grab of Windows color management uh, section, and they are using a monitor profile to print with as a yeah. printer paper profile. Yeah. So explain what a monitor profile is and what a printer profile is so that people don't make that mistake again. Well, a, a profile is basically a map of it's a description of how that device produces color so a monitor profile describes this device right here in front of us right yes. <clears throat> describes your your monitor and how that renders color uh, a printer profile describes how the printer renders color so if you think of a color value a lot of us are familiar with RGB values. So let's say we have a RGB value of 255, zero, zero. So full red, zero red, green, and zero blue. So that would be the brightest red you can get. Well, if you send that value, 255, comma, zero, comma, zero, to your monitor, you're going to get a different color than if you send 255, comma, zero, comma, zero to your printer. So the profile is basically describing what that color truly is in a in a lab color space. So what the true color of 25500 is on your monitor versus what it is on your printer. And it's a little more complex than that, but I think that's probably the best way to describe it to get people to understand it. So if you have an accurate monitor profile that describes how your monitor produces color and you have an accurate printer profile, then you can get a reasonably accurate soft proof, but it does depend on both. Mm -hmm. So, um, you want to go through the screen? Yeah, yeah. If we go back to my screen, it, Q image shows you the monitor profile that's currently being used. And that's one that I created with a profiling tool. So I have a profile for my monitor, one for my printer that happens to be for this semi-gloss paper. So that's how it knows what to do in a soft proof. And we've got to print on the page, and we click the soft proof button, which is this little eye down here. And it will show you what that print looks like on the um, paper. So one, one useful thing about QImage is that if you click paper white, if you, these buttons down here are black point compensation, simulate paper white, and um, gamut check to see if things are out of gamut. And I'll go over those. But... If we click paper white here, we'll see that the – you probably can't see it in the video, but um, the color of the paper changes slightly. It's simulating what the paper color is. It's not just going to show white on your screen. Um, so that you can – when you do that, you can look at this as a page, and you can see the white around the picture and kind of get an idea of what it looks like. But one thing that I wanted to mention is uh, we do have gamut check, which a lot of tools have. And if you click this, it'll show you what areas of the image are out of gamut, meaning that basically they're too, the color is too bright for the printer to print because the inks don't cover that area of the color gamut. So if we check this on this image, look what happens. The entire bird is listed as out of gamut. The little gray bird. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So the gray areas are the areas that are out of gamut, and that's saying the printer can't print that. Well, some people freak out and they say, well, I can't print this bird. Nothing on this bird can be printed. But what people don't realize is this is showing you what areas are technically out of gamut 
by the printer. The inks can't quite cover that bright of a shade, but you don't know how far out of gamut it could be. It could be, you know, 5% out of gamut in this red area and only 1% out of gamut in the yellow area. Or it could be, it can produce this color just not quite that bright or not quite that dark if it's the beak or, or something like the that. The intensity, the intensity of the color. Right, the saturation, the right. Paper. So um, this does not mean you can't print that or that it's gonna look terrible. I still typically print it with relative colorimetric or colorimetric as a lot of people say. Um, and I'll see how it comes out. I use this gamut check more for, I think relative colorimetric is the, the best rendering intent to use. So I'll print everything in that first. And only if I have trouble and I say, well, I'm not seeing any detail here in this red section or this color looks a little off, then I might come in here and do this and say, oh, that's why it's outside the gamut of the printer. And that at that point, I might want to try perceptual. And you can you can slightly see the difference here in the two. Mm -hmm. If I switch back and forth. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. We pr probably shouldn't get into the differences between these rendering intents. Uh, no. You've covered that before too. Yeah, I've covered that um, before. Plus, we want to have time for some questions too. Um, but I, you, you asked about uh, something else here too. So let me close the soft proof. So I, the, the whole thing I wanted to point out here is if you see something being out of gamut, don't freak out because like I said, this could be, this whole bird could be very, very slightly out of gamut. But what that means is a, a gamut is like a, a hull of a boat. It's like a 3D map. So if this is only slightly out of gamut, then it's very close to the gamut hull that the computer and the uh, printer can render. So it doesn't have to go very far. It'll still look pretty good. Um, anyway, let me jump over here. And um, I clicked anything. I clicked this without saying anything here. So next to printer profile, you have your profile. And if you hold your mouse here, it'll tell you uh, relative calorimetric, that's what that RC means. BPC, that means black point compensation is on. If you want to make some adjustments to the color management here, just click on this tool here and it brings up this. And you have some additional options here like uh, absolute calor calorimetric and saturation. These first two are primarily the ones that are getting used. But the new one that you were talking about, Jose, is this auto. And what that does is it will automatically switch between, it, it defaults to relative colorimetric, but it will switch to perceptual when it sees that a lot of your image is out of gamut. So that's useful if you just want QImage to handle the color, the switch between these two. Like I said, if you print in relative colorimetric and you notice some color problems and you often find yourself switching to perceptual, which can sometimes rescale and make those look better, then you could try the auto here. And in this case, I can tell you that auto will automatically switch to perceptual on this one mm -hmm. because it discovers that a main area of your image here is out of gamut. So it'll use perceptual in this case. And in another image that might hardly have any, I haven't checked these. I don't even know. What does this one look like? A lot of these, you find out that they're, there's a lot out of gamut and you didn't expect it. But this one, no. See, I do a gamut check on this, nothing's out of gamut. So this one, it would pick relative color metric. Mm -hmm. So that's how that auto works. Yeah, perceptual will, will systematically shift everything it needs to shift to make room for the out of gamut colors. I have found it to be quite uh, evident on the standard evaluation image, if you use, um, if you do a check, a gamut check, even in Photoshop, which is a very gross, you know, in or out of gamut check, uh, the four little kids that are in yeah. that in that image do not change at all. No gray right. at all, any of them. 
when you are doing a uh, a check under say soft proofing and you choose from relative to perceptual there's your kitty from relative oh, to perceptual is. welcome to the live stream cutie oh look that's at you. that's jake he's 17 years old oh my gosh i had one that was made it to like 22 and then finally so doing, jake? oh nice kitty that yeah. looks like our uh, grandson's kitty except that one is a girl anyway um they what i noticed was when i went to perceptual under soft proofing the kids skin tones changed yeah and that is something that cannot be you cannot accept that so right i was scaling use, everything yeah, yeah i would use perceptual on something like a sunset or a landscape that does not contain colors that you can recognize as being wrong you know rendered wrong yeah and so anything with a face in it never use perceptual it'll right. it'll literally if there are any colors out of gamut it'll just shift them and tell the the uh, flesh colors to get up and move and right. you cannot do that you cannot do that so relative color metric always for portraiture especially little kids that type of thing so and oh wrong layout here we go so if you have that option check then it'll automatically that's just one less headache to deal with right right yeah so that that's good that's a good thing to have i haven't really played with it yet but because i'm 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 always uh on on relative i always have q image set for I, I pretty much do the same yeah <clears throat> All right, the last one, and we're gonna we're not gonna stay on too late here. Um, multiple job setup. I know this is something that you may have shown me in the past, but I thought this was a recent addition, and you may have a video that you recently uploaded where you have mm. like a uh, a job yeah. with with like you save a job, but it contains multiple jobs. Is right. that, did I imagine that? I can, or I can that show real? you that. I can show you that real quick here. I've always wondered if I can save Pro 1000 job and then something I the same, you know, um, birthday party or whatever, and I printed something big on my roll printer, but it's related to the same job. Can I save the PA 100 job, you know, the 17 by 37 print? And also yeah. my smaller prints from the program. Yeah. yeah. I can show you that yeah, real that's... quick here. Um, the the new option here, and this is this basically was born from the need to for bigger shops to print from multiple printers. They might have I've heard some shops they'll use one printer strictly for 13 by 19s. Right, And then they'll use another printer, sometimes even the same type, but it's a different printer, and they'll have 11 by 17s in that one. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to be able to print to a bunch of printers at the same time, in air quotes, same time. So what we have here, if you go to the file menu, is a multi-job plan. So if you go to the multi-job plan here, it's simply a way to add multiple jobs that you've saved. We, sh we showed you how to save jobs. So you could save a job for your Pro 1000 and your Epson tank printer uh, and several other printers, 2100, a big printer. You could have several jobs saved, or you might be creating a new job and some packages for people or something. So instead of, you know, putting 20 prints into the Pro 100 and then clicking print up here and printing that. And then after that, creating your job for your, uh, your Epson printer and then printing that. You can put multiple jobs in, in here and it'll just print them in succession. And the way that works is um, you can go to user saved jobs here and pick some jobs that you want. Now, I've, I created a couple here when I was making this feature um, and I, I had to restore them today for, 
for just to because I wanted to show you this anyway. Um, I have one for the G620 and one for the Pro 100. So I can click on this job and say, add that to the multi-job plan and then click on the Pro 100 and add that to the multi-job plan and then just close this window. This is just allowing you to pick your jobs that you want to mm -hmm. add to the plan. So I added two jobs here, uh, one for the G620, one for the Pro 100. So before I print these, I want to analyze the jobs in the plan. It's telling you what to do here, but I just I'm going to analyze these jobs so that it will fill in this information. So now I can see this first job is to the G600. It's on plain paper. It's eight and a half by 11 sheets and it's one page. The second job is a Pro 100 uh, printer, photo paper plus glossy two, same size, but this could be a different size here. This is just showing you, OK. I've got a, on my G600 printer, I've got to load one sheet of plain paper. On my Pro 100, I got to load one sheet of glossy paper. And then when I have all these filled in, you could have a bunch of different jobs in here and they could be 20, 30 pages long. When I click print jobs, it's just going to go through these one at a time. It'll sit on this one and print it, process it until it's done processing. That's the key, processing. And then as soon as QImage is done processing this job, it'll go over to the Pro 100 and it'll process all the prints in that job and it'll keep going down the list. And what happens is because QImage can process and send these jobs to the printer much faster than the printer can print them. Let's say you had 20 pages instead of one on this one and you had 20 pages on this one. You're going to end up with both of these printers printing at the same time. Okay. So that, that is what opens up the possibility of being able to print to multiple two, three, four, five, six printers at the same time from QImage without having to, you know, do them sequentially. Well, I got to finish the job on my Pro 1000 first before I can switch over to my Epson. And then I got to do that one. You can set it all up first and then go here to multi job plan mm -hmm. and then just add the jobs that you've saved and just walk away. And let it do everything. Yeah. So the jobs that you save are multi-image job, multi-image layouts. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just real quick, I'll go back here. Uh, these are the ones I've added. I can, um, in the file menu here, I can save the current multi-job plan and save it as uh, G620 and Pro 100 plan. Mm -hmm. Save that. Now, when I come back into QImage later, these are, uh, you know, it, it remembers what your last job plan was. So I'd have to close QImage and reopen it for it to clear that. But you would only have to go into the multi job plan and do, go to File Open and then open this plan that you saved for, you know, I've got five or six printers set up the way I want them to print exactly these images i open it and it it opens this way it shows them all and then you only have to analyze the plan to get it to fill in the table here mm -hmm. and then click print and you're done wow okay so it's more for big shops than anything else because right right yeah you know you may have six different printers different sizes one's 24 inches 44 inches up to 60 you no know, 64 inches and you're printing different things you can set up these jobs if they're things that you do frequently and then just have it print to multiple printers. And when you come back, you know, from lunch, you've got five or six printers still printing. Right. Yeah, that's great. So this is really targeting just a, a slightly different demographic of printer. It was, yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a request of course, from right. some of the bigger shops. They want to be able to. Now, do are you getting, are you getting a lot of requests for possible, um, features to add uh, oh. to, i haven't gone back to look at the forum uh you know it's been a while since i checked your forum out but um are you getting a lot of feedback from people um we so we constantly get feedback and there are so there's there's one thing that uh we are working on that is a new poster feature that allows you to print tiles mm -hmm. i saw that question in the yeah, chat the question earlier that was here earlier 
Um, Let me see. That's probably going to be the next feature that's coming to both Ultimate and QImage One. And you can you can already do uh, canvas wraps, right? Yeah. This. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you don't have to switch back to my screen, but we. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Now, now that we're here, there's two okay, things that we added. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, make, I'll make you juggle here. Yeah. There's two things that we added in, in Ultimate and one in this latest version. One of them is you can have your cut marks that are on the page. Let's say I want okay. uh, crop marks. You see these crop marks right here? You can have those be yeah. any color now. You can choose any color that you want. That's just a small feature. But what we added to QImage 1, this last version, is this canvas shrink compensation. That was only in Ultimate before. Mm, so we okay. put that in QImage 1 as well because it's a printing feature and people want it. So you can, like, if you print on Canvas a lot and you notice that it's shrinking along the length, you can compensate for that. There's a little calculator. You can say what was the length that was specified, what actually printed, and it'll do it for you. Right, because now I'm glad you brought that up. I'm so glad because uh, there's a lot of people complaining that they're getting the wrong dimensions lengthwise. Yeah, that uh, happens a lot with canvas. canvas. And canvas is cloth. So That's it, what this it, the feature it, it is for. for the length due to the moisture from the ink and whatever. So I, I just, I'm, yeah, I'm I just mentioning that I because place. I went to a hotel yesterday and I saw some canvas uh, prints floater floaters on the wall yeah they were horrible not not the image itself but the the, wrap, the mounting the room the mounting was yeah. horrific you could see where the the either the repeat or just a black edge is just completely misaligned and it may be due to the fact that there is stretching taking place you know after the print after the canvas becomes wet with ink Especially on a on a very right. dense print, um, and those 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 um, stretchers are pre-made; they're not custom-made. Uh, so, yeah. you know, the 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 resulting print no longer fits. So you can adjust for that if you find out, yeah. figure <clears throat> out like at what rate does it stretch. Yeah, the the canvas yeah. the the roller or the wheel will pull the canvas through the printer, mm -hmm. and it depends on the printer, the canvas type, and a whole lot, lot of other factors, which is why we have this feature here. But basically, it'll put ink on the paper while the paper is still feeding. And then when the ink dries, the canvas shrinks. But it only shrinks along the length because it has to do with how the paper is being fed while the ink is being placed on it. And of course, the printer is never going to stretch it this way across the roll. Right, right. The paper is only going to stretch as it's dropping down in the the take up below it, or if mm -hmm. the feed is stretching a little bit as it's moving the paper through it, but the printer is never going to do any side, you know, tension on mm -hmm. the paper. It's going to put tension as it's rolling it. And because of the tension and the ink laying down, it only stretches in the length. Mm -hmm. And so what you can do is you can use the canvas strength compensation and click on the little calculator. And if you know it shrinks 1%, of course, this is saved with jobs too. And it's printer set up so that you can uh, save for certain canvas types and then recall it later. But this little calculator here is how you do it. If uh, if you say it, it was supposed to print, uh, you know, 64 inches is what I specified, and it came out 63.75, that's a 0.39% compensation that's needed. So you just put in. Well, I specified 64, but I got 63.75. And you click use that value, and here's what you get. You get 0.39% shrink compensation. And now when you print it, you'll get exactly 64 inches. So you must have had people commenting about this. Yeah, it's an old you that's been in here. This, because... this has been in here and QImage Ultimate for quite a while, for right. probably yeah. at least... Yeah, I never really seven or eight years. That. I never, never, ever considered that. But the reason I mention it is because we get requests sometimes for people that see a feature in Ultimate and they say, I want that in QImage 1. Okay. So you're asking, do people request things? I find more because QImage Ultimate has so much in it already that we find more like somebody will say, I, I'd like to have this shrink compensation in QImage 1 because I'm using a Mac. And I can't use mm -hmm. Ultimate, so can we put this in QImage 1? Well, it went in there in this 
previous version from last week. It's NQ image one now. So, so this this shrinkage or stretching does it occur on all types of canvas paper, um, canvas cloth? Most whether, most type of canvas. It is, whether it is a, uh, you can buy pre cut sheets. Yeah. As well, but on roll, um, wh where is the the tension occurring that causes this to happen during the the, the way of the? I have no personal experience in this, and I'm not a you know mechanical engineer. Mm -hmm. But from what I have read, the way it was described is <clears throat> the rollers, the the way the the rollers feed the paper. Um, I don't know. Do do most roll printers pull the paper through? In other words, is the roller in front of the head or behind it? Are they pulling or pushing the paper? There's something behind as well because you load you load rolls to the rear or the manual feeder, and it's it actually triggers a sensor, and then you see the paper or the canvas in this case advancing long before it reaches the platen where the printhead actually lays down ink. There's another set of yeah. rollers there as well. So I don't know where the tension is taking place. I saw, I'm just curious well, just, to see uh, where. The way I've seen it described in, in the most reputable places that I've read about this phenomenon, like when I was developing this feature years ago, from what I remember is, imagine you are the one feeding the paper. Mm. So you you go up to the the printer and you pull a little bit of the roll through and you're, you're holding on to it like this. Now the, the head makes a swipe across the paper and you're, you're taking your hands and you're slowly pulling the paper out like this mm -hmm. so that the printer can continue printing on it. Mm -hmm. As you're pulling the paper, you're putting tension okay. like a, a stretch into mm -hmm. that paper as you're pulling on it. It's like a rubber band. Imagine pulling a, a rubber sheet yeah you're you're stretching the paper a little bit when you're pulling on it now with the paper stretched you apply some ink which is a liquid onto the paper as you're stretching it and then after it comes out of the printer and drops down into the the tray below yeah then you're letting go of that tension and when the ink dries because it dried on stretch paper it shrinks it back like your clothes mm -hmm. shrinking a dryer that's the way that I remember it being explained. So what would As you do? You would, you would then, um, in order to figure out the rate so that you can enter that value on Q image, would you print something of a specific dimension and just measure it? Yeah. Measure if the it manufacturer it. tells you the amount of shrink, and I, I have seen yeah, that. They, the, they may know, yeah. They'll, uh, I've seen it up as high as 1.75%. Okay. You can go on forums and people will tell you how what mm -hmm. the percentage shrink they're getting out of this particular canvas paper. But if you have to do it yourself, you basically have to screw up once. Yeah. So you got to print one. You don't have to print it very we'll long. Figure you can out what the rate of 20 inches. Yeah. Yeah, you can print 20 yeah. inches. Just you don't want to print like eight inches. You, you have to print yeah. long enough so you can long measure it. Get, yeah. I mean, if you're only getting a quarter of an inch change or a half an inch change out of 60 inches, how yeah. you know how accurate is your ruler? You're going to have to print some length, and then figure it out right. and say and tell in that calculator that I showed you. Just say, well, I asked for 64 and I only got 63 and a half. And then from then on, if you have that value in there, Cumage will compensate for it and know that it's going to shrink that much. And what it will do is artificially stretch it that much, mm -hmm. knowing that it's going to shrink. So it'll actually yeah. print 64 and a half, so that you get 64. I wonder if it, it, if it depends on the printer model. It depends on the printer. It depends yeah. on the the type of canvas being used. Right. And it even depends on how much ink is getting placed on the, mm -hmm. the uh, page. The ink but that has it. such little yeah. effect that basically any print that you print will have the same okay. amount of shrink. That's good. That's, that's good to know so, that you can actually compensate for that. Yeah, and that, as I said, it came up because you asked, are people asking for things? Mm -hmm. And that, I wanted to mention that one. Yeah, they more often they ask, well, QImage Ultimate has this feature. Can we put that in QImage 1? And, mm -hmm. of course, we wanted to start out with a clean slate to see what people needed first. We don't want to be putting 
yeah everything from and ultimate in there so you sit down with andrew or call him up mm -hmm. and yeah and then we go by what the customers are asking for mm -hmm. And I think we've added most of it. We've added the vast majority of printing features from Ultimate into QImage One. So let me see if I, I saw that tiling question. What was that? Oh, here we go. So what exactly does he mean by that? It's just a poster. Okay. Uh, some some people say, uh, I think it was mentioned on, on your stream one time, Triptych. But mm -hmm. Triptych is a specific example of a, of tiling. It's like three panels. That's why it's triptych. But this is a poster feature that's going to allow you to take any image and split it up over multiple pages or multiple cuts or various would, amounts of would overlap. Would you depend on a certain percentage of overlap just so you can trim <clears throat> down those three? That's the thing. Perfectly. Q -Image, Q Image Ultimate or, can already uh, print posters. Okay. But it, it, it's a feature from long ago and it doesn't have very many options the the when you when it prints poster panels um it, they have to be butted up against each other there is no overlap there's no selection for that there's no mm -hmm. gap so in the in the new feature which is going into both ultimate and q image one is going to be a redo of that poster feature with lots of options in there ability to visualize the poster panels, arrange them any way that you want on the page. Like let's say you're printing on roll paper, but you still want uh, nine panels of eight by 10, right? Mm -hmm. So you could print eight by 10 panels, three by three, arrange them however you want, and visually through the user interface, visually butt them up against each other or have a little bit of overlap. Or sometimes you you have a window, like in a restaurant or something, you'll have a window and you'll have slats in between. Yeah, that's so what I don't the opposite, see. The opposite of overlap is you can have a gap. A gap, yeah. And you can account for that. So you'll be able to adjust it both ways. So that that's going to be a big feature. But yeah, that's normally gonna, when I see you know, tile uh, layouts on, on places, offices and, you know, hospitals and that type of thing, um, they'll have a missing section. In other words, if the gap between each tile is three inches, there's three inches of image missing. Yeah, otherwise it should it be would, missing. Would, yeah, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. Right, know? it should be missing. Right. It shouldn't be like so you're just putting them. Is that pre? Can that can that be pre-programmed into when you print these tiles? I want one inch to be gone between the right side of tile number one, the left side of tile number two, and vice versa with tile number three. Yeah. Otherwise, you have to kind of cut, you know, cut that excess inch off. Yeah. I, I, I could see programming handling that. Well, yeah, your and your 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 gap, yeah. you know, this way may be different. You may have a wide gap right. here yeah. and a small gap. You know, I can't move my hands quite that far, but a small gap this way. Mm -hmm. So all of that will be in the interface and it'll be adjustable and all it'll right. be a really nice awesome. way to create posters. So I think I think Stephen will be happy if that comes to play. That, yeah, you have to give us time a, for that one because that's, that's, that's going to be. For. I didn't, that's a big feature. Yeah, I wasn't uh, aware exactly what it was that he was. To get it done with that level for. of complexity is going to take some time. So yeah. maybe by fall. And so this person here has been using. I just got a notice this morning that my basic version, QMachan, had expired. Must be a sign I upgraded to the lifetime version mm -hmm. just now. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Great. People are loving yeah. that lifetime yeah. version because it's. Yeah. I wonder if I priced it it's, too low. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. It's, because everybody's it's, getting the lifetime version. Yeah, I know. Which means you never have to pay again. So, I told Andrew it's all fun and games until we run out, and then everybody's lifetime. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's on yeah. us. So you know, obviously we are. Have the you lifetime. have you had any um, from a multi-user type environment? I know you had a. a uh, Oh yeah, we gear system for multi computer. Yeah, we've sold site licenses okay. to different site businesses. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, sold a number that would of those. Be good for like a graphic art center or something like that. Yeah, and those are automatic lifetime. I'm looking so. for see if I see any Q image. Uh, folks, ask ask Mike while we have him here. Uh, any questions you may have? Uh, let's see. Oh, here's one. I'll go back after we say bye bye to Mike, and I'll acknowledge everyone else that I, I have um, missed here. 
uh, both merch. I have both versions, but the Mac version is faulty. It crashes using different features. So could he talk a little bit about QMH1 on Macs? Actually, Andrew would be the one talking. I don't know exactly what he, and let's see, there's another. How about some info QMH1 on Macs? Well, Mike is not the programmer for the Mac version. Um, his neighbor, Andrew, is. Yeah, but it's not, I, I, I won't, you know, punt the yeah, question. We'll, I'll answer the question. Um, what you should do in that case is send, I don't know, Jose, here's, can, you, can another, you type this in your, I, I don't think I can type it in the chat. No, you cannot. An, Andrew, to. Andrew at Benartem.com. Okay, Andrew. He's our Mac guy. At Benartem. Yeah. So email him with the specifics of whatever crash or anything that you're having. And we always get right back to you, even on weekends. Yeah. Go ahead and look at so, the, uh, the, the lowest. Yeah, that's right. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. And uh, he's, he's the Mac software developer. You've got an answer directly from him. And I can, I can tell you right now, we are running into some, some problems with the new M1 chip some of the new operating systems. There's even a bug with Adobe right now that involves the way that the plugin is launched. Um, and there's workarounds for all these. They're, they're pretty rare that they come up, but every once in a while we'll find somebody that has this combination of this software on the M1 chip and this, you know, and we'll, we'll email you back and give you the, um, the workaround or the fix for it because some of these things we can't do anything about it because it's an Apple bug. In some cases, it's an Adobe bug. Uh, it's a, a bug with how the the new, Mac, the latest Mac operating system operates with the M1 chip. So I have no idea. We get very few complaints about people having crashes or problems on the Mac, but we do have some. And what I've noticed, because Andrew CCs me on, on all these support emails, so that I'll know what's going on, even though I'm not the Mac guy. And most of them, of them that are coming back, I can say those rare ones that are coming through where somebody's having a problem running it, it's almost always been, okay, well, this is not quite working as it should on Adobe now with the M1 chips, but here we have a solution for you. So just send an email and you'll get a solution. All righty. Even if it's not something we can fix, we we know what the problems are and we can identify what's causing it if you give us enough info all right we can tell you just you know, email do this, him and do that. Uh, explain to him his uh the problem he was upset that i was hogging hogging up the time here with you and not letting people answer or ask questions <laughs> anyway uh that's going to be that always is the end of the live stream when i then open up the floor for people to ask questions I usually prepare questions for guests. Um, I have to explain that Mike uh, did this at the spur of the moment, and I thank him for that. And I had asked him if I could ask him some questions, which is what I did. And hopefully that answered uh, many of the questions that are commonly asked, you know, through me. And I'm not the I'm not the Q image guy. So yeah. Anyway, Nolan, uh, no, or Nolan, uh, sorry about that. Uh, but I hope that now you have a contact point to, uh, you know, try to solve the problem you're having. And uh, that's all I can say. So anyway, anything else, Mike? What would you like to talk Not about? Not that I can think of. I mean, so, you can ask me anything. It doesn't even have to be about Cuba. You can ask me my favorite I color if you want. Covered, yeah, I pretty much covered everything. I'm trying to think of what on my normal workflow, what is it that I sometimes find a little bit um odd i usually i actually use some of your editing uh functions uh if i just want to add a little bit of global a uh, um, little bit more saturation of color i'll use the uh, tool i double click on the image and go into the editing mode yeah can, can you just give us a really quick rundown on what that actually is so you have yeah. that image open just double click <clears throat> on it and it'll yeah, open just up a new window just quickly, whether the image is here or it's also on the uh, the printed page, double click either. Either I can double click on the print or double click on the thumbnail, and it just when you double click, it opens up an editor. 
And this is basically an old control panel version of, you know, we wanted you to be able to do certain things without having to leave QImage. If you're using QImage standalone and you don't want to have to go into Photoshop just to, uh, you know, brighten this a little bit or sharpen it a little bit, make it look a little bit sharper. You can do those kinds of uh, full yeah. image editing here. Or if you've just got, let me see. Uh, Your autocorrect functions I use a lot, especially noise reduction. Noise reduction, if I'm using a not one, you know, maybe not one of my images and it's a little noisy, um, I will apply that and it works great. Yeah, yeah, and the if exposure, you I do the auto exposure one quite often. Uh, if I'm printing something that's not that, you know, super important, I'll do the auto correction for exposure. There's shadow, uh, mid tones, and uh, noise reduction, and all of that. I use that a lot. Yeah, and I, sometimes you might have a, a picture of a a kid or something, and they have a little blemish on their skin, and and mm -hmm. you know you can you can use the editor to you know kind of it doesn't work too well on feathers, but you know if you've got a if you've got a little blemish, let's see what this wood looks like here. It works great on blemishes, but I don't have any kid pictures up right now. Um, How about the little the little tiny black this dot little right dot there. right here. Yeah. See, you can just drag over it and and get rid of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so little little things like that. If I wanted to clone out a person or something or a, a bigger area, then I could take that out. Um, and then, you know, this will go away. It won't be a distraction anymore. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to clone a person or do some, you know, heavy handed editing, I'll do it in a photo editor. But, right, right. you know, stuff like this you can do. And, of course, you've got your raw. This is a raw photo. I can tell because it's purple here. Mm -hmm. you, can, you have refined raw here. And, you know, an image like this you can do a whole lot with. I, I won't bore you with the details here but let me uh you know i'll try to give you one little example um if you wanted the the water to come out more down here uh or you might want a more green detail in this green boat you can mark it and say optimal dynamic range focus on that area you see how the that boat popped a little bit there mm-hmm yeah. Um, and th these specific clouds right here, I, I want a little more detail in like this area. I can put a little bit of focus here and you can watch the clouds, you know, they get more contrast. Mm -hmm. if, if I wanted the, the water right here, if I'm interested in, in seeing that, I can hit the optimal dynamic range on that and, you know, it gives you more mirror effect on the water. Mm -hmm. Or you can... You can add some fill light or take the fill light down. Mm -hmm. So you can do a lot with raws in here, rebalance the white balance and stuff like that. So there's raw editing too. So those are the two types of editing you can do. Yeah. And it, again, it's just to give you something to where I see uh, this picture right here and I just want it to have more contrast. I want it to pop more. So I bring it into the editor and I might just pop up the contrast a bit because I, I want more contrast. And then um, a little preview here comes up. I've just added 20 contrast. So you can click on this button right here and it switches back and forth. It'll show you before and after. Before and after. And you can use different magnifications for your preview. Yeah, I can I can go in a little yeah. tighter and see the, the weave and the, the hat and stuff like that. So if you were trying to sharpen an image beyond the normal default sharpening you, this would be a good way to to you know see what the effect would be yeah this is already a really sharp yeah, photo yeah. here sure. but it does this this has um two this has deep focus sharpening applied already already so yeah. mm -hmm. if i take it out um you can see what it looked like before the sharpening and there's a real close up of the the weave there on the mm -hmm. on that. So if I put a two in here, radius two, strength one hundred, deep focus sharpening. 
you can see the deep focus sharpening, sharpening that. And you can see before and after. Yeah, you can see immediately the results, and especially the black and white yeah. bands down there on the bottom. And you can see there's absolutely no halos. It's completely halo free. Right. Even with the white band down there. Very clean. So, yeah, yep, that's the editor. That's that's the magic. Yes, indeed. And uh, again, that's in, that's a feature of QImage Ultimate. We don't plan to put that in QImage One. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, because QImage QImage One, the primary thing, the thing we keep saying about QImage One is it's supposed to have the printing features you need, mm -hmm. so that you can use your your photo editing tools, uh, like Lightroom or Photoshop, and you can just use the um, plugins to send your photos when they're when you're done editing them and QImage one is the, the printing tool QImage ultimate is like the ultimate so it has more like the editing and yeah it has uh the image you know the database searching and stuff like that where you, you can uh -huh. add keywords and find your images like this one right here i might be able to put a hat in there and it pops right up so yeah so that might be a good subject for the next time you come by. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I haven't done a lot of exploration of that feature. I don't have as many images as you have uh, and as many jobs as you have already saved. I only have maybe maybe yeah. 50 jobs that I have actually saved. A lot of the jobs that I do are not important enough for me to save them as something I can recall later. But I'm sure they are still listed on that one um you know, where you yeah. didn't manually save it. Yeah. Well, and right. generally, generally everything that I print, I have a, a eight by 10 of a Let me see. tree frog uh -huh. on the, on the wall. And when I print that, I'll usually just tag it with like this one right here. I, I might, uh, I might click on this little information button here and I might in the description, I might put Emmett bird. Mm -hmm. Now, a year from now, when I'm talking to you again and you say, bring up that bird again and show us that gamut thing you were showing. Mm -hmm. Now, when I go into the the uh, search tool here and type uh, gamut, maybe I don't even remember bird. I'll just search for that word and there it finds it. There's good 97.55 and I can just click on that and it takes me right to it. So excellent. Um, but when I what I was going to say is when I print one and I have it on the wall, I might want to reprint it, it might fade, might need another copy somebody else might see it and want one right so i've got a frog on the wall now and if i go in here and i type frog i'll do it right now uh there's my frog right there that's what's Ooh. on my wall and i can tell right. which one i printed because i rated it a five this is mm. this is the one that's on my wall the one that i printed okay it comes out nicer on print than it does on the monitor so <laughs> yeah I use that database search all the time. All righty. Well, so, I think that's about covers yeah. it all. We've been, oh, sorry. That was good, We've unless been, anybody has any I've other questions. I've been cutting back from the normal three hours to th two and a half, and we are right at that point right now, three, three, three. So thanks again, my friend, for. Yeah, well, thanks for having by me. By the on. way, it's always so, fun. This is the guy that saved my hide when my channel, my video channel, got hijacked. He led me down the right path and we made the contacts that we needed to make uh, to fix it all up again and bring me back to where I am now, which is hopefully this will not happen again. It was horrible. And uh, no, Jose did out, all the work. I just made a yeah, couple come suggestions. Come to find out that many other channels have been hacked and hijacked entirely by the uh, same person. But you know what happened? Karma is a wonderful thing. So during the several days that he basically owned my channel, guess how much money he generated in like three days, over $1,200. When, nice. they, when they caught him, they turned that money into my account and I received it. That's the most, the most I've ever made. <laughs> That's in perfect. YouTube. I love yeah, it. So that, that shows I love it. that uh, you cannot mess around like that with people's lives. I that probably you. barely pays for your time, and, but at least it's and something. The thing is, he he used a legitimate identity and passed it on as himself, as he was jack you know hijacking people's channels. It's it was crazy. Anyway, yeah. that's water under the bridge. 
So um, thanks again, my friend. And I hope yeah. that you have thanks for having me. a wonderful time. Um, I've been trying to get down to Florida lately, but I checked the flights and they are ridiculous, especially now with the uh, cost of fuel. I saw some $600 tickets to Orlando. Uh, that's not what I normally pay, you know. Yeah, that's pretty that high. Is, that is nuts. And two two seventy five is good. Yeah, we were we were going to um, attempt to visit my sister in law in Milwaukee, and all I saw was four hundred ninety to six hundred dollar tickets, and again, that's just a little bit too high. But anyway, we'll keep trying. Yeah. All right, thank all you right, well, again. Yeah, thanks well, again for having me. Let me know when you want to come back. And anytime you have anything new to share, All right. feel free to come and join us again. Just let send me an email. And uh, it's always nice All to right. have someone that I don't have to then talk so much. Anyway, all yeah, right. And everybody remember to use Jose's links if you're going to buy yeah. QImage because you yeah, get you a get discount. Your 10%, get that discount. You were going to have a, uh, were you planning on doing a, um, a uh, special sale this uh, Memorial Day or was it? I I don't think we're gonna do a Memorial Day sale. Memorial. We're probably gonna do a July Fourth sale. Okay. Um, so so not nothing you know right around the corner. And so if they use the link you provided me, they'll get a double so, yeah. discount. Use Jose's link oh, yeah. and you'll get a discount anyway. So get a double discount. Awesome. Anyway, all right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye bye. I'll see everybody later. All right. Always great to have him. He hasn't been with us for quite a while. And again, I apologize to you, uh, Mr. Uh, Nalan. Man, uh, normally when we do have a guest, I sort of let him have the floor and then we, any questions that come in, because I had to create a, a um, set of questions for him because he really didn't have anything to cover at this point. Normally he prepares a program and he's on his own. No questions will be answered. Uh, or post it and I usually wait until the very end and if he has time then we address such questions so I apologize for that sorry anyway let's see what else we had we had a bunch of people here that I just kind of glossed over because of the uh, great guests that we had here uh, let's see make sure that I get everybody so Tony Huerta we dealt with him I posted my links those are all in the video description, so make sure you take a look at those and uh, take advantage of the 10% off. So that always helps. Um, yeah, he has an update. Uh, like I said, um, Canon 200 updates. There's nothing really to update about. It's a fabulous printer. It outperforms the Pro 100 OEM versus OEM inks. Uh, it, it really, it really, just hit it out of the ballpark. It's amazing. Uh, Stephen Paulboy from Toronto, Canada, Epson ET 8550. One of my future printers. I hope to be able to get one, one of those this year. I'm looking to see if any local sellers will have one because uh, Epson is out of stock right now with those. Um, yeah, so tile picture has been addressed. Nitrous Dude, Ontario Working Group somewhere. I really don't know. Uh, you might want to ask Mike Lee. He lives in Ontario in the uh, area there, closer to New York, though. Um, I don't know anything about any special groups in that region. Miss Wendy is here from Belgium. Glad to see you, my dear. Pro 1000 and all OEM. Gerner Larsen from Denmark. One Pro 1002 Pro 20s? What is that? Two Pro 100s. QMH, you mean two 200s? QMH Ultimate, Adobe Lightroom, OEM, and Octo Inc. Ian Spires. Ironically, I just got noticed. Yeah, we saw that one. Again, I'm just going through everything here. Make sure I don't miss anyone. Gardner says, QMH is my daily go-to print tool. Awesome. Um but I would like to know how to come with improvement suggestions. Um, improvements for what? Are you not satisfied with the uh, results? I think it's about as good as you can get using that combination. From cycling, 
Should I set my own clock schedule every 48 hours or every 72 hours? No, you cannot stop. You cannot stop the cleaning cycles. Uh, they occur regardless of what you do. Okay. Uh, exercising your printer using the unclog tool just simply keeps the nozzles um, firing and free. Uh, it does not stop the need for schedule cleaning cycles or when the printer feels it needs to clean. And Canon printers, as I have said many times before, they utilize what they call thermal print heads. They heat the ink and the ink that little tiny amount of ink in that little tiny uh, nozzle receptacle gets heated to almost a boiling point. It expands and it ejects. That's how it works. So that process creates residue that has to be systematically cleaned off or removed. And the only way to do that is with a cleaning cycle. So that is just part of the system. That's part of the um, um, system that thermal printers use. Epson printers utilize cold firing printheads. They are patented, only Epson and a couple of other companies use them. And Canon and everyone else, including Lexmark and, and Brother and you know HP, they all use thermal printheads. Okay, and then we, we saw your question. I gave you the uh, email address from Andrew, for Andrew, so you can contact him. And when you do that, um, Mike Cheney will also see the same email. Maybe both of them can help you solve that problem. I did have an issue once with QMH1 for Windows. It did sort of uh, shut down on me as well. So it might be an issue that may have to be addressed. Who knows? Michael Smith, any plans to do something with the Epson P900? No, not on my on my side of things. I really don't need to invest on that kind of printer. You cannot refill it. You cannot use third-party products here in the USA. So it's a no-go for me. If I was living in Europe, then possibly yes, because it is not locked over there. It is locked just like the P800 is here in the North America region so again no point unless i was just doing reviews and i don't do reviews i teach how to print so to me that would be a waste of money really hm thanks for the great live stream epson xp 15000 qmh ultimate corel paint shop pro oh nice 2022 and lightroom 5.7 refilling soon with pc inks yeah i you have to you have to create custom profiles with the XP15000 when you do switch over, okay? Soon he will have profiles for many different papers for the XP15000. I'm going to have to ask him about that because I was looking for one the other day and they simply do not exist. They're not, they haven't been made yet. I believe he might be working on that at this point. All right, Henry Stoffel, sunny, wet summer, like Medford, Massachusetts, Epson, P800, OEM Inks, QMH Ultimate. Everybody remember to click the like button. Thank you, my friend Henry. Michael Smith. Yep, I shop there, Epson P900 user. Shop where? Okay. Newland Man says, why not let him answer some? Yeah, you see that? I am not hogging my live stream, my friend. I'm letting him hog my live stream because he is my guest. And that's the way it, it, it runs. That's the way it goes. So again, I hope that you can solve that problem. Simply contact them and they'll take care of you. They're good people. Donald Wingate, hello, everyone. Hello back. Rick Johnson, thank you, Jose, for having Mike on. I really learned a lot. And I did buy it through your link. This was a great show today. Thank you, my good friend, Rick. I hope you're doing well. Jerry Lonkel says, thank you, Mike and Jose. Very interesting and helpful. Ian Sp Spears, Jose, photoprinting, thank you for repeating my question. To prevent my Canon Pro 100 from cycling, 
Should I set my own clock schedule? Yeah. Again, that is only going to help you keep your printer flowing. Whether it, it, it generates a cleaning cycle or not, you cannot stop that from happening. Okay. Also, be aware when I have a guest on, he has the floor. And I just feed him questions. Questions on the chat will not be addressed until after the, the, the uh, guest leaves. Unless he stays for the whole three hours. And if that takes, if that is the case, then I usually don't address anyone on the chat. And that only happens once in a long while. I usually always acknowledge everyone. Unlike other live streamers, you should go to some other live stream. They will never address what you're asking. So I'm not, I'm not like that. David O'Regan from Ireland, and he says again, so he must have been, he must be a return watcher. W.C. Anderson, see you all next week. Got to run here. All righty. Be safe out there. Richard Bender, hot Hagerstown. Yes, it is uh, 90 here today. R3000, I thought it was going to rain that we're talking about a big storm coming uh, later this afternoon. So far, so good. Mike C. Cheney, for suggestions, I mean, we love suggestions and appreciate them. Yes. So, you know, there, there is a forum on the QImage Ultimate website that you can actually join and access and put in all the suggestions you would like to see happen with QImage. Um, there's some old archaic functions that may not be relevant anymore this day and age, and I think he's going to address, maybe look into that. Um, you got to remember, this is a 25-year-old program that has been evolving all of this time. Um, and so, you know, things change. Some things may not be needed today. Maybe they're not relevant anymore. So it all depends. And so, again, if you have any really good suggestions, don't be too nitpicky. Um, go to the forum and post them there and he will read them i guarantee you and if it's something that can be actually made or programmed into the existing um, software i'm sure he will consider doing it as long as it's not something super difficult to do ian says thank you for answering my question very much appreciated all right again don't feel like I'm ignoring you. It's just when I have a guest, I I always let them have the floor. And in this case, I had to come up. I had to come up with a set of questions for him. Jerry Lonko says, Jose, would you consider doing a regular segment on how to take great photos? Oh, boy. See, that may not be something I can handle. I am a technician. I am not a very creative person. And so... I, I know, I mean, I, I can I can probably have um, someone come in and discuss how to do composition. I can give you the very basics that I learned in art school, but, you know, um, this is a skill that you're literally born with, if, if you get what I mean. And some people can take some amazing photographs just by the angle of the camera the you know the position the 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 composition if you will um and again some people just take crime photos you just click that's it all right that is it for now again i thank everyone for spending what three hours almost of the afternoon this sunday with us and again i i just managed to get mike just like three days ago to um be able to come in he had nothing to talk about but he had promised me to to be a guest soon he has been um, extremely busy with personal matters the last month or so and so he couldn't come on so i'm just grateful that he did and uh, hopefully we had some uh, interesting subjects for you guys and of course remember if you are interested in getting q image do not buy it straight away. Get the 14-day trial. Try it out. 
as well as you can and then make the decision. If you do make the decision, use my link. It'll get you a 10% discount. That's all I can say. And I have been a QMH user for 20 years. I discovered them after their fifth year. And I thought this is a pretty good tool, especially for someone learning how to print because it tended to do things for me that I would normally have to think about you know, doing it correctly. So I'm very grateful for that. And ever since then, I have been a faithful user. All right. Oh, I hope to have Mike Lee possibly next week as well. Um, as you guys can probably tell, yeah, I, I can no longer speak for, you know, two and three hours at a time. So that's why I love to have a guest. All right. So that's going to be it for today let's play some music what i love for you guys to do is just if you enjoy the show just post it on the chat as we play the music and we'll see you next week saturday saturday not sunday saturday one o'clock all right bye bye everybody